uh, Secretary of Air Force, centering his tenure to the great state of Maine, General Paul Nakasone, who has two hats, uh, Cy head of Cyber Command, and uh, uh, C Director of the National uh, Security Agency, and uh, Mr. Horacio Rosensky, the um, President of, and CEO of Booz Allen Chemical Incorporated. Um, I'm delighted to be um, leading such an esteemed panel, and I wanted to um, start our conversation today picking up um, at um, some of the topics that um, Abby Philip covered so well in her panel this morning. And I wonder if we could pull up um, a graph from the Reagan um, Forum uh, survey that was released this week looking at national security topics and how Americans view them. So if you look at that survey, what you'll see, this is a survey about the threats that uh, Americans are concerned about in the next five years. It goes from 2018 to 2022, and you'll see that cyber attacks lead those concerns consistently and really far ahead of any other um, major national security threats. And so given that we're gonna be on a panel talking about national security, I thought it would be a good place to start to look at um, these results and ask each of you to talk about um, how we talk about these issues. You know, so often I hear from readers and um, um, those who are interested in this topic that one reason that number is so high is that people don't really understand how the nation is tackling them because of the sort of classification, the secrecy around these topics. And so my question to each of you is, what metric should the American public be using to assess the success of the nation's cybersecurity? Um, given that they can see so little about it, and how are you trying to um, create a space where some more of this information is releasable so that they can have a better understanding of the work that you're doing? Would you like to start us off, Secretary Hanger? Sure. Um, you threw me a little bit of a, a curveball with the, what the American public should be thinking about part of the question, because I was thinking about it more from my perspective and the metrics I would use. Um, when I look at the chart, it's fascinating because the thing that I think may drive it more than anything else is the, 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 the recency of events that are in the full mind of, of the public. And if you look at the terrorist attack uh, gradual decline over time, all it would take to dramatically change that curve is an attack tomorrow. Uh, cyber attacks are high because they're happening all the time, and there's a certain level of awareness of that. In my position as Secretary of the Air Force, I'm mostly concerned about the two at the bottom of the chart. But I guess if you added them together, you'd be right there with cyber, and that's thermal nuclear war and, and conventional military conflict. So from my perspective, uh, and, and I don't have a good answer for you for the American people. I think uh, American people in general, I hate to say this, they don't look at metrics very much. They, they listen to stories about what's happening, and they create impressions because of that, or they form impressions. The metrics I'm concerned about are the ones that give me a sense of how cyber secure my forces are, the forces in the Air Force and Space Force, um, how able we are if called upon to go do our job, and how convincing our deterrent capabilities are. But there's a large spectrum of things that influence that. I, I was thinking earlier about how my career entirely spans the uh, creation of the digital age and the level of concerns about cyber, what we call cyberspace, becoming pervasive and ubiquitous, and, and it, it is. And you can't do anything in the security area without thinking about cyber considerations. Uh, most of what I worry about is uh, traditional forces, effectively, right? We just rolled out the B-21 yesterday. Um, but all of those forces have to be secured, so that's my first priority. And metrics that help me understand that is my first priority. Then there are metrics associated with what kind of offensive capability I might have and how I might be able to use that. And much of that, of course, is, is obviously classified. So those are the sorts of things that I'm focused on. I would judge the metric from uh, Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. the dog that didn't bark in the night. Mm -hmm. The difficulty here is that success is something that doesn't happen. And it's hard to measure that. Uh, but I think, for example, here's, a, here's a, a, I think a perfect example. At the beginning of the Ukraine invasion, a lot of people assumed there was gonna be a cyber attack. There were gonna be major cyber attacks in Ukraine there might well be a cyber attack on us. That was one of uh, Russia's uh, in their toolkit. I'm convinced that the reason that has not occurred is because of this guy, uh, that uh, we have literally deterred uh, Russia from a cyber attack because they know that we have the capacity uh, to make them pay a high price. So uh, I think you can say that over the past year, the fact that there are 
there certainly has been cyber Russia uh, cyber activity in, in Ukraine. Some in in Europe. There were a few recently in Poland uh, that we're concerned about. But by and large, that has been constrained. I think uh, because of <coughs> good policy here that has developed a cyber deterrent. Uh, on the other hand, the other piece of this that's so important is we have to rethink conflict. We all think of conflict between countries as army against army and navy against navy. In this situation, 85% of the target space is in the private sector. So we have to have an entirely different kind of thinking about how the interface between government and the private sector works in in cybersecurity, uh, because the government can't do it. We can't we can't sit at every computer at a at, at you know a Raytheon facility in Boston or or Whole Foods in, in Texas. It's got to be at on the local level. Cybersecurity starts at the individual desktop. General Nakasone can do everything right, but if somebody in a in an engineering firm that works for a major defense contractor hits on a phishing email, we can be in real trouble. And so this, uh, we can talk a little bit more about this, but the, to me, one of the keys to the, to the defense of this country is developing a relationship of trust, which frankly often doesn't come naturally, between the private sector, particularly critical infrastructure, and the, the, uh, the United States government, which has extraordinary capability, but we have to have that relationship so that we can see threats, define threats, see where they're, uh, where they might go and uh, combat them. So uh, that, that would be, I'll go back to uh, the dog that didn't bark in the night so far. You're keeping that dog quiet. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Senator. I think your point on deterrence is an important one. Um, today's the 3rd of December. One year ago, a Hunt Forward team landed in Kyiv. 10 people from the Cyber National Mission Force landed there, and the leader of that team called back, and she, she said, we're going to be here for a bit. And so for the next 74 days, this team grew from 10 to 39 people working in Kyiv, working with our partners to strengthen their defenses, to understand what's going on, and also provide a bit of reassurance. Presence matters in this space still. You know, this is a domain that everyone says, oh, you're going to do it, you know, from afar. But when you put people forward, you know, this team from the Cyber National Mission Force, this Marine Major who is leading her team, this really stands as the example of, okay, there is a lot that has changed, but there's still some things that are foundationally sound here. So presence. And the next piece is, is persistence. So for what hasn't been talked about Ukraine, which you would ask to, for us to comment on, is the work that forces like 16th Air Force did and U.S. Army Cyber Command and the Cyber National Mission Force to strengthen our networks. I talk about Kiev and I talk about you know, what we were doing hunt forward. All that came back to the senator's point to inform the tradecraft, the malware, the ransomware things that we're seeing that's shared with the private sector. And suddenly you have an antidote that is not millions, but actually billions of endpoints that are taken care of. And then the last piece is, is partnerships. This is what has changed dramatically. We get to scale with the private sector. We get to scale with the private sector, but the private sector is also interested in what we do as well. Why is that? because we operate outside the United States. We understand the adversary. We have technical expertise. Uh, these are things that really have, I think, um, based on the Solarian Commission and so many other things, have kind of grown this partnership. And it's not only the you know, DOD, it's DHS and CISA, it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, that's taught us a lot, and that's just one year old. So uh, I, I see the chart, and I certainly understand it. I think a lot of that is driven by you know, perhaps not fully understanding, and I think to your point, Perhaps more of the information that we can share is also a good thing. So good morning. Uh, I, uh, I'm not a warfighter. I'm not a policy maker. I'm, I'm here as an uh, industry person. Um, and, and the perch that I have of this is uh, because Booz Allen has, uh, at least will be rated as having the largest work for cyber workforce in North America. And we have the privilege of working across all of the main verticals. We work in intelligence. We work in defense. We work in the protection of the Daga, we work in the private sector. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, uh, in the last four or five years of the lifetime of this chart, uh, the level of sophistication that each one of those verticals has experienced is breathtaking. Um, maybe it was the target breach uh, that where the CEO got fired that got all of us CEOs worried about this. 
uh, at a completely different level. But the level of investment, uh, the, the level of effort has greatly increased, and that is the good news. The challenge continues to be at the seams, at the intersections uh, of all of those uh, elements, whether it's the cyber protection of weapons platforms, whether it is law enforcement connectivity to the private sector, you name it. That's where, uh, while progress has happened, clearly, more uh, needs to be made. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, something that didn't used to happen five years ago that happens now is every time a Fortune 500 company goes to acquire a mid-sized company, uh, they're going to do a cyber due diligence. And they're going to be looking at their cyber program and trying to understand at what level of risk they're onboarding uh, onto their uh, own networks. And every one of these due diligences comes back the same way. Um, underfunded, unsophisticated, lots of holes. And these mid-sized companies, uh, while they may not be as prominent, end up playing a critical role uh, in, in the supply chain, in the critical infrastructure, and in the attack surface of the nation. And so closing down these seams, making talent, investment, and information travel faster across them is, I think, the next step. I think you all hit on some key points, and I'd like to kind of use a real-world example that happened recently to have a, a discussion about the effectiveness of cybersecurity. I'll open with you, General Natasoni. We just had a midterm election um, where there were fears of cyber attacks, and I'd like to get a sense from you what, what your grade is in terms of how the nation did. There were concerns that China might try to meddle. Were there examples of that? Are there lessons that you saw going forward that, that you can share with us in terms of cybersecurity and, and elections? So this is our third election at uh, U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security. It began in 1820 and now 22. Um, bottom line, a safe and secure election. Uh, but it's a safe and secure election because of a whole of government effort. It's, it's not just us. It's, it's the fact that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, CISA, state and local levels are all tuned into this. Uh, what should we think about it? Uh, first of all, from 18 to 22, we've seen the threat expand. So in 18, we, were, we called ourselves the Russia Small Group but it expanded from Russia to other, other countries. The second thing is that we continue to see information operations. Information operations done from throughout the world, outside the United States that we are tracking. The third thing is, is you know, it is interesting just to see the role of private sector and academia, let me talk about academia for a second, that is developed a level of expertise that really understands what's going on. And the last thing that I would say on this is the fact that what we have learned is that our recipe for success hasn't changed. We generate really good insights. We share intelligence and information with the FBI and CISA, and then we take action against adversaries that are going to try to do us harm. We've done that since 18. We're going to continue to do that in the future. Uh, very, very proud of the work that has been done. And I think that you know, if we've learned anything, it's more partners are better. And being able to get to a larger scale in terms of what we're being able to expose, what we're being able to share, what we understand, that's success. When you say safe and secure election, I want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. Is it, are you defining it because of that cooperation that happened, because you were able to thwart new threats? Can you give us a sense when, what, what, what safe and secure election, as you define it, looks like? So safe and secure election for, for us is the absence of interference, uh, interference in our election. And so, again, the responsibility to lead for that in the United States, obviously, is uh, DHS, CISA, and uh, FBI. We play a supporting role, uh, and that's what we do. Okay. I wanted to go to a topic that came up throughout our opening statements, and I imagine will come up for today in general, which is Ukraine. Um, as you all know, there were expectations um, at the early days of the war. Senator King made reference to it that there would be a series of, of cyber attacks on electricity and, and other infrastructure in Ukraine, and we didn't see that. Um, and I'm curious. Um, we saw it, but we thwarted it, right? I mean, they were trying. They were trying. And, and so here's another interesting point. You asked, what's some other facts that I should uh, talk about that perhaps haven't been exposed? Uh, the past year, the National Security Agency has released 24 different cybersecurity advisories, unclassified, things like last January. This is what to expect in terms of Russian attacks. That's released publicly, and so you say, hey, that sounds a little different. Yeah, it's tremendously different because we operate in a space to the senator's point where almost 90% of the critical infrastructure is controlled by the private sector. That's how we communicate our message. Well, I want to come back to that, and then we'll go to Ukraine, but to Secretary Kendall's point, 
the, the idea of sort of the story that the American public should know. You mentioned these reports, but my, my sense is in talking to readers and listening to readers is that they don't quite understand the story. So how does that thread those reports that you referenced to, to the story that you think they should know about, about cybersecurity, how they should be thinking about it? Pointing at me? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, they should understand that we can provide reasonable levels of protection against cyber attack if we make the efforts to do so. I think Senator King and his work with the Solarium Commission was really uh, very, very professional and really laid out a number of the things that we need to do across the, uh, the spectrum of things we need to do, not just the military. And I think from my point of view, uh, for military systems, if we pay uh, attention to them, if we put the resources into them, we can be reasonably cyber secure, but we have to do that. You have to, you have to accept that overhead, if you will, uh, to provide that feature. But the attacks will continue to evolve. They're gonna get more sophisticated over time as we build better defenses. And one of the hard things about metrics that came up earlier is you, there are always unknown unknowns that you have to deal with. Uh, so you can have a pretty good sense of what your posture is. Well, one observation is that over the last few decades, our ability to secure against cyber attacks has improved pretty dramatically. Uh, Richard Clark wrote a book a couple of years ago talking about this and building in resilience. You're never going to be perfect, but you can be highly resilient and you can be at a point where even if you get an unexpected attack, you can recover. Uh, so the, the enemy, if you will, and whether remote it's in, is buying time, but they're not really destroying you or defeating you. So it's, it's we've moved into a different, I think, era, and I think General Michael should talk about that maybe uh, uh, the other panelists. So we're getting better at this. Uh, I don't know that I would say the advantage was entirely on the defensive side at this point in time, uh, but it's more so than it was at the beginning of the era of cybersecurity and, and, and cyberspace activities. So when a country like Russia, and I think this is a good example, tries to mount an attack in Ukraine, given some preparation, given some effort put into it, you may not be able to entirely defeat that attack, but you can blunt a lot of the impact of it. And it's important point to make that when we're, we're talking about, we're using the term cyber attack, and there are really two pieces. One is denial of service, breaking down the electric grid, those kinds of things. The other is disinformation. Yes. And uh, Brad Smith touched on this. Disinformation is the, in, in, in the long run, may be the more serious problem, particularly for a democracy with the First Amendment. It's a very tricky thing. I don't want the government restricting information. Uh, Ultimately, and we, we thought a lot about this on the Solarium Commission, ultimately it really rests on education. Our citizens have to become better consumers of information and not believe the email that says, you'll never believe this. <laughs> you know, Obama put all the aircraft carriers in Norfolk so they could be bombed. And want, I mean, I, I actually saw that email. Uh, and we can't, it, it, with the First Amendment, we can't restrict it. And what we saw, I, I also served on the Intelligence Committee during our study of the 2016 election, the Russians didn't invent the divisions in our society, but they'd take cracks and turn them into Grand Canyons. That was what they were, they were, they were you know, hitting citizens, Americans against Muslims and all those kinds of things. And that's a very difficult thing to cope with from a governmental point of view. Our, we have to be, um, more discerning in terms of, of information. And I think that the reality is we had a thousand years to figure out the printed word, to figure out you know what are the standards, editors, fact checkers, all those kinds of things. The digital age is 20 years old, 25, 30 years old, and we haven't developed the, we all are applying the same standards. If it's in the printed word, it must be true. You know, there are fact checkers and those kinds of things. And now somebody used you know, Times New Roman font in their basement, and we think there's some, you know, we apply the same kind of uh, instant credibility, and we have to get much better at that. It has to start in the early grades with kids, I call it digital literacy, mm -hmm. so they can discern when they're being misled, when they're being manipulated. Um, but I, again, I think it's very important to, th to think of cyber as involving really two separate pieces, and, uh, the mechanical part, the, 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 the cyber attack is certainly important. And General Nakasone was being too modest. In 2018, they were very active in, in, in dealing with uh, the, what the Russians were trying to do in our elections in terms of, of a, 
defend forward. And that got the Russians' attention. And I actually, I honestly, as I said before, believe that, that a big part of the reason we haven't had the level of attacks we might have expected is the old, you know, peace through strength, deterrence. Uh, and the fact that the, the Russians and others realize that we have the capability to uh, impose costs. You talked about education. I think one area that we learn about technology in particular is often in wartime. And Ukraine has been a, um, a, a test bed for, you, for Russian cyber attacks. And so we're watching in real time, I think, some of those attempts. And I, I wonder if you could help us understand a little bit more about what we've seen, what we haven't seen. I, I know that there's been a lot of efforts by the Ukrainians themselves to um, bolster their defenses. How much do you think of what we're seeing is because Russia is choosing not to be more aggressive in a bid to collect data from those, those open systems? Um, how much coordination are we seeing um, between their conventional and cyber attacks on infrastructure? I'd, I'd like to open it to all of you. And I'd love to hear it also from the, from the private sector perspective in terms of what you're seeing. So if I might begin, so we've seen the Russians conduct a number of destructive attacks within Ukraine. We've seen also them take down the, the satellite communications within the country that impacted outside of Ukraine as well. Uh, we continue to see information operations. Uh, give a lot of credit to the Ukrainians, a, a high degree of resilience. You know, also, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, that the Russians had planned for a commercial satellite company coming into Ukraine and providing that type of support, mm -hmm. which gets to the point of the private sector and the role of, you know, the private sector in being able to develop a, a, a level of resilience. But, you know, again, this, this is uh, also an adversary that uh, this, is, this is not through, and, and we remain very, very vigilant. And so we take a look every single day to ensure that, you know, that we are engaged with our adversaries to understand what they're doing. Do you see a coordination happening on the Russian side between their conventional attacks and, and their, their, their cyber attacks? And I'm not referring to the information one, but the, the, the offensive one, if you will. Well, I think if, if you were talking to the private sector, they, they would certainly show the, you know, the, the instruments of, uh, of this type of coordinated uh, of efforts. I mean, this is, this is an adversary that truly understands it, that has done this before in other conflict zones. Uh, but again, you know, the, the capability and capacity is one thing. The output, the output and effects is another. Uh, generally speaking, military systems are designed with some degree of hardening. Uh, they use encryption a lot more, for example. Um, and, there are, and weapons designers are aware of cyber threats. So it's harder to go after those targets inherently. What the Russians have traditionally done, if you go back to Georgia, uh, operations against Estonia earlier, uh, in serving this campaign, is they use uh, disinformation, the thing that Senator King talked about. They, they try very hard to influence um, uh, opinions, essentially. And when you think about it, Russia is run by a former KGB officer. And when you contrast that with China, uh, which is a much more economic focused, the threat from Russia tends to be in the disinformation side and trying to influence politically. The threat from China tends to be, and these are great overgeneralizations, uh, in intellectual property theft for a variety of reasons, espionage plus economic reasons. So you get different sets of threats there. There's another category, which is one that I worry about more, which is associated with weapons. And penetrating a weapon system is inherently a much harder thing to do. And the Russians have not, as far as I know, had much success with that. No, I think I agree with everything that's being said. The, the big challenge here has been that, that it's been both conventional and non-kinetic at the same time. Uh, their information operations uh, efforts are extensive, beginning with inside their own country to shore up support for a war they're losing. Uh, and in the neighboring countries and, and extending beyond. I think if you talk you, about a disinformation campaign, the disinformation campaign within Russia exactly. yeah, is extraordinary. Exactly. It's propaganda, basically. Uh, and then as it relates to American companies, uh, I think we, we have to thank uh, NSA and CISA and the law enforcement uh, agencies for putting forth a lot of information, declassifying things very quickly, making things clear to everybody about what was going to happen and allow American companies, especially the American companies that took a strong stand by exiting uh, Russia and, and creating uh, additional economic difficulties there uh, to be protected from what uh, could have come and could have been much more catastrophic than it was. I want to pick up on something that you said and, um, and has come up in the panel a lot. We, you, you've described a Russia that's been aggressive in trying to, and in some cases successfully launching cyber campaigns, either in dis disinformation or in Ukraine. 
So do you, how concerned are you that you, we could see a Moscow using um, cyber warfare, maybe um, its internal um, criminal cyber outfits to harm um, the West during the winter and make support for uh, Ukraine harder, particularly in, um, and across Europe? Uh, is that a worry that you have that we could see those kinds of attacks, that the limitations of what's happening in Ukraine manifest that they instead go after Ukraine's allies in a bid to, to break support. Is that something you're watching? Are there trends that suggest that? There's no right. question that that part of Putin's strategy is to undermine the, unification, the, the unity in the West. We're going to see a lot of uh, uh, disinformation or uh, information kind of campaigns, particularly in Europe and here. We saw some of it here going into this campaign, into this midterm election. Uh, you know, Putin, Putin wins if if support deteriorates, and uh, there's no question that that's going to be uh, this winter, as times are tough. And by the way, times are going to be very tough in Europe. I, I get a daily uh, energy price brief, uh, and and uh, as of this morning, the price of natural gas at Henry Hub is about the, the U.S. natural gas price is about seven dollars a million BTU. It's forty four dollars in Europe. Think I had, I mean, that's it's not marginally higher, it's dramatically higher, and that's going to be a ripe area for exploitation by, by the Russians, there's no question. Mm -hmm. okay. To build on that, um, so I think, as Senator King said, Russia's number one strategic goal is to undermine NATO support for Ukraine going into the winter um, because things are going to stall, and, and that's their opportunity. The, uh, I was just in uh, Germany and the UK visiting with the 600 Bruce Allen people that are, are supporting all of these missions over there. And when you got into conversations with our staff, their number one concern is how am I going to pay my heating bill this winter? Uh, I don't have a thousand extra dollars to, to spend heating my house. Uh, and, and so then this is where uh, Russia probably is already or will run information operations in Germany, in Italy, in all the places where they may sense weakness. Uh, and uh, you hope that NATO as a, as a complete entity uh, with the support of NSA and Cyber Command will actually have the right defenses. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing we hear frequently is that um, China and other countries are watching what's happening in Ukraine, both conventionally and from a cyber perspective, to see what they can learn in their own um, goals. And I'd, Secretary Hemp, I'd love to start with you because um, you're, you're looking at this from a warfighter perspective. What do you see um, lessons that China could be potentially taking away from the war in Ukraine that potentially has applicability to Taiwan? What are the trends that you're seeing? I get that question quite a bit, actually. Um, and we all, we're all looking at this very carefully, and we're thinking about what we're learning from it, and we're also thinking about what others are, are likely to learn from it. The, the things I would like uh, China in particular to learn from, what, from this war are, first of all, that the economic consequences of uh, doing an aggressive act may be much more severe than you, you, would, you would prefer. That um, your military uh, may not be quite accurate when they're telling you how good they are. Um, you know, I think uh, President Putin was, was, was very, I won't say deceived may be the right word, but he certainly overestimated dramatically the capabilities of his own military. Including um, their cyber, cyber capabilities? It, including cyber capabilities. And the, the, other, the other thing is that the short war you anticipate may not be the war you get. Now those may not be the lessons that are being learned, those are the ones I'd prefer to be learned. The lessons that may be being learned are more about, okay, if we're going to go do an act of aggression, we have to do it in a way which is much more decisive. Uh, and learn from the Russians that way. So I'm, I'm, you know, that, that is another thing you can get from this. Um, one thing I would hope also in general is that there are a lot of unknowns associated with conflict, whether it's in the cyber world or in the conventional world or the, the more, more conventional world. Cyber is becoming conventional. The, the, um, uh, the efficacy of the things you might want to do may, may sound pretty good. You might even have experimented with them a little bit, but when you actually put them into practice, you may find that they don't work as well as you anticipated. Yeah. And the Russians are still trying a lot of things, I think, and they're having very limited success in some of the things they're trying, uh, which is encouraging. So that, that's where I would uh, hope would be happening. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rosensky, I know that uh, Booz Allen has looked at this and studied this issue. I'm curious from a private sector perspective, what are you seeing in terms of how China's thinking um, going forward in terms of the cyber, cyber attack capability? So, you know, China is the facing challenge for the United States, and, and it's a technology challenge, and it's a talent challenge almost more than anything else. 
uh, and it's not an in the future, it's something that is happening now, from the theft of intellectual property to their cyber attacks, uh, to their territorial ambitions. Um, our, our cyber team uh, did an extensive study, all open source, uh, on, on how China goes about cyber, and there's a couple of salient things that I think are, are pretty important to note. One is that while the United States is still ahead technologically and in terms of capability, uh, they're much more unrestrained. Uh, they don't seem to care about getting caught. And that gives them the ability to do certain things that, that uh, the Western world will not do. Uh, the, the second point is that if you want to know what China is going to do in cyberspace, it is almost entirely aligned to their rhetoric. Uh, so every time they complain about something in the world stage, it is either preceded by or followed by uh, a cyber attack. And the third thing is that uh, while they're brash, they're also capable and patient. Uh, there's a really good uh, example that, that our team uh, collected in the study about how uh, after Taiwan uh, began a, a discussion of independence in 2017, I think it was, uh, they went after the energy industry. And the attribution is clear, and the capabilities were pervasive, and uh, it was pretty successful at almost hijacking a critical industry for a period of time just to make it clear that if you get out of line, uh, cyber is going to be a tool that they're going to use. So I think every one of us needs to be, especially people who are threat officers or CISOs in the private sector need to be very much aware of what the rhetoric is, how it applies to their agency, and uh, how to defend against it. I, I, think, I think we have a lot to learn from, from Ukraine, tactically, strategically, but also historically. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the Ukraine situation is, is an affirmation of Mark Twain's famous observation that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it usually rhymes. <laughs> and I, I actually approved a letter this week from cons to constituents. I get constituents' letters who say, why are we doing this? We have a lot of problems here. Use the money for home heating oil. Forget about, you. why are we doing this Ukraine business? Billions of dollars. My answer, my first line of my answer literally said, Google Sudetenland in 1938 <laughs> and Rhineland 1936. And that's what we're seeing. And I think that's one of the learnings of this is uh, despots tend to be expansionist. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, Maya Angelou says, if somebody tells you who they are, you should believe them. Putin has been telling us for 20 years he wants to reestablish the Soviet Union. And Ukraine is where he started. I have no doubt that if they had swept into Kiev in a week and, and decapitated the government and essentially taken over Ukraine, that we would now be seeing uh, probes into the Baltics. Uh, I mean, that, so that's what's so important, I think, about what, what we're doing now, because history tells us that if you don't confront this kind of activity, it inevitably, inevitably will, will get worse and worse. If Hitler had been stopped in 1936 in, in the Rhineland, 55 million lives could have been saved. And people come to the other question I get from my constituents is, why are we spending so much money on defense? The answer is the only thing more expensive than establishing this credible deterrent is a war. And that's really what we're trying to talk about here. But I think Ukraine is being instructive on a lot of levels, on what you're learning on, on, the, on the ground. But also, the, this is an important moment in world history uh, that we've basically said, no, uh, uh, taking over another country on your border by force is not acceptable. I want to ask one other thing on China, T. General Nafsani. We've seen protests recently um, in China over COVID restrictions, but there have been some concerns that um, because of some of the um, efforts by the Chinese uh, censorship um, uh, and propagandists that we haven't been able to actually hear the voice of protesters. At the same time, on Twitter, we've seen um, that they, the new CEO has decided to lay off the entire content moderation teams. Is it a national security concern when a private social media company can suddenly collapse its content moderation teams and in doing so, create space for authoritarian states like China to control the online discourse in their favor? So I'll leave that, Nancy, to the, the policy folks to, to work that out. Here's what I would say. Um, the whole discussion on influence today is, is a critical discussion because our role in influence operations outside the United States is to expose it. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things that was at the panel this morning is this decision by our government to release a lot of information 
last year about Russia and Ukraine. And that was Which didn't you know, come naturally to you guys. But was done very well, I yes, think, right, was. Senator? And I think that, you know, what we have learned, why was that information released? Really for three reasons. One, build a coalition. Two, disrupt an adversary. And three, enable a partner. And so if you're Chinese senior leadership, perhaps that's one of the things that you're most concerned about, is what you've seen in terms of that effect that, that we've been able to have in, in this type of uh, uh, release of information. Could you see a scenario, though, where it could play itself out domestically, where you have people sort of um, hijacking hashtag campaigns in an effort to, to flood out discourse? Is that something you're looking at as a way of um, silencing protesters, even domestically? So again, outside the United States, that, that's where we operate. That's where our authorities are. And certainly, if that's occurring, then we're going to, you know, given the direction of the, uh, the President, the Secretary of Defense, take action. I think one of the most serious problems of this moment is the power of a despot to control their population. Yes. It's almost impossible to conceive of a popular revolution that would overthrow the Communist Party in China, even if there was hugely widespread discontent. Iran the same way, Russia the same way. The, the ubiquitous surveillance, uh, torture, secret police, the, the, the technology of, of repression is so powerful today that you, it, it's, it's very difficult to imagine a popular uh, human rights kind of thing that would actually be successful. Uh, it just, it, it, it's, it's almost inconceivable in, in those countries and that's, that's, a, that's a modern reality. We thought in the, in the 80s and 90s that, that the internet and fax machines were gonna sort of, you know, the Arab Spring, you know, information was gonna liberate people. But now we're back to George Orwell where technology is actually being used more in terms of repression around the world. And that's, that's a, a fundamental strategic reality that I think is very difficult to, to cope with. Let me piggyback on that a little bit. I, I couldn't agree more with Senator King that I, I am terrified of what a regime can do once it gains control of information with modern tools. That uh, facial recognition, uh, monitoring where everybody goes on their phones, who they talk to, what they say, uh, what associations they have, the tools are just unbelievable for control of a population of society once you get them into your hands. And how to get them out and how to organize any resistance in an environment like that, I, I have no idea how you do it. But there is another aspect of this, and I think it's that we're, we're still in a free society wrestling with how to deal with this new technology. And, uh, and analogies you can make are use of propaganda, once upon a time print propaganda, Later there, again, Senator King talked about with the Nazis, use of radio very effectively to influence population. And that's something that's continued. And then later television, right? So now we've got this new way to, everybody can self-publish. Everybody has almost infinite capacity to put information out there, whether it's true or false, and for any purpose. So we have to figure this out. And as long, while we're a free society, I think we can do that. Uh, but we're gonna have to figure out what the rules of the road are, and we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna enforce them without taking away people's freedom. Um, one of the things I think we're gonna have to do is we have to become much more sophisticated consumers. And if you look at earlier uh, attempts to influence human beings through advertisement, commercial in particular, or political, you know, they were kind of crude. And people became better at understanding um, you know, what, what was real and what wasn't. And you know, we're all less, I think, susceptible to advertisements than we might have been once upon a time. A lot of us are still very susceptible to political influence by people we trust. And we're gonna to have to work on that. I think we have to work on that as a society. Uh, or we could go down a road that, that once we get down it, we get into a position where it's gonna be very, very hard to recover. Mm. So to build on Secretary Kendall's point, uh, just for context, it took about 100 years from the invention of the telephone until telemarketers started ruining dinner. <laughs> it took 20 years from the first email to the first spam email took five years from the creation of Facebook to the first pedophile uh, being uh, tried for using social media. Uh, these cycles to where a new technology uh, has all a, a really good run before malicious uh, things happen to it uh, is really shortening. And so this is an area where private and public sector we need to learn to collaborate much better in order to try and get in front of all of those issues. Because when we talk about AI, we talk about 5G, we talk about quantum, uh, the promise is extraordinary, 
and some of the challenges in terms of attack surfaces and so forth are also they are also real, and we need to get to those issues much faster than we have in the past. It's somewhat beyond the scope of this discussion because we're all talking about cyber. I'm very worried about other technology-based uh, attacks, electronic warfare. Mm -hmm. All of these fancy weapons we have depend upon GPS. What happens when GPS is knocked, is, is gone? Uh, you know, a simple example, but uh, electronic warfare, hypersonics, directed energy, uh, the history of conflict is often who sees the advantage of technology first. I just read a wonderful article this morning about Genghis Khan was able to conquer the world because of the stirrup. That's right. That was the new technology in 1207 that enabled his archers to, to ride and shoot at the same time. And that technology, and then you flash forward to you know, the Battle of Agincourt and the Longbow radar in World War II. We've got to be thinking broader. I mean, cyber is clearly the, a, an important piece of battle space, but, but so is electronic warfare. And it, it relates back to cyber because we're so cyber dependent. The good news is we're the most wired society in the history of the world. The bad news is we're the most vulnerable society in the history of the world because of that. So I just, I, I don't, in you know, 10 minutes, don't want to get into electronic warfare, but it's, it's, it's something, we've we got to think of this as a broader sort of technological based challenge. I'll, I'll piggyback on that also. I've got Chief Brown here from the Air Force, and I think Chief Saltzman I saw earlier from the Space Force, uh, and I saw it coming up for earlier this morning. Uh, it's not just technology, it's how you use it. It's how you integrate technology into operational concepts and employ them together. And the changes that Senator King talked about are very real. One that's very apparent in Ukraine, and it was apparent earlier regarding Karbov, is use of un un unmanned systems of autonomy and how much that's changing future battlefields. So we have got to get, we've got to understand these technologies and we've got to understand the, the, the optimum military application of them and get there first. Mm -hmm. We're in a race there just as much as we are for cyber. You have just a couple minutes I'm gonna, before we take questions. I'm going to come closer to home and pick up on something, Mr. Rosansky, that you said earlier about how there's good cooperation happening, but at the seams there's areas of improvement. And I think what you're really talking about is structure. And right now we're having an ongoing discussion about the structure of cyber command and NSA. General Nakasone, I understand that uh, General Dunford has provided his report and his recommendations in which he decided didn't decide definitively whether the two agencies should be split. What is the future of those two organizations? Would you support a split? And if so, when would it happen? So Nancy, at the end of the day, this is a policy decision that will be made. Uh, anything decision, we're, we're going to support this. But what, what's my reason? Why is the dual hat so important for, I think, the nation? It gives us three things. First of all, it gives us speed. It gives us agility. And it gives us unity of action in a domain that moves so rapidly as as Horacio was saying here, this is, this is not years and, and, uh, and decades. This is you know, you know, days and weeks many times. And so being able to rapidly adjust to election security or ransomware or Russia and Ukraine is enabled by a command that is world class in signals intelligence and also in cyber. This is the future of, of what we're seeing today. This is the changing nature of conflict, right? My past two decades, I spent time going into and out of different countries where I was able to put my boots on the ground, where I was able to put in ground sensors, where I was able to you know, do all the things that we needed to do and fly all the airborne intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance we wanted to over that country. We're not doing that today. But yet, we're having tremendous success against our adversary. That's because we can operate with speed, agility, unity of effort in cyber and in signals intelligence. I'll, I'll summarize what he just said. The last thing we need is two new silos. NSA and CyberCon are so complementary, and if they were, if it were separated, in my view, and I've, I've sort of modified my view on this over the years, it, it would be, uh, I think we'd lose a lot. Uh, I, I put an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to make this, this position an eight-year position, like the Chief of Naval uh, Reactors. Uh, this guy wasn't crazy about it. He, he just bowed his head down to see now when he said that. But what he doesn't know, it, it, it didn't make it into the, into the committee bill, but what you don't know is that we're now getting it into the final bill, and it's, not, it's going to be life without parole. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it on to my wife. <laughs> well, I, I'd be remiss to not ask you, General Nakasone, you've been in the job for five years. It'll be six in May. 
do you uh, anticipate having the sixth anniversary there? What do you think about your future? It's an unusual to see someone in uniform in the same position so long. I'm just curious how you're thinking about your future. If you wanted to make any announcements today related to that. <laughs> Nancy, I serve with the pleasure of the Secretary of Defense and the President. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is a great opportunity. We've gotten some wonderful questions from the audience, and so I'm going to go ahead and put those um, to you, and I'll leave it to you gentlemen to decide who wants to take these questions, because um, they have not specified um, who they I'll go to. I'll take the easy one. Okay, great. Um, you tell me if this is an easy I, th I think they're all hard, though. Um, what are the combat domains that are most efficient in terms of the integration of cyber capabilities? Could you say I'm, that again? I'm so sorry. What are the combat domains that are the most deficient in terms of the integration of cyber capabilities? Cyber is integrated in everything. Uh, you can't point in any domain. You could argue perhaps under C maybe, but um, the, we, we take it as a given now that cyber considerations have to go into anything we build. And any warfighting concept that we, that we think about, we have to think about cyber operations as part of it. Uh, one thing that I think is true when, when you talk about de both deterrence and you talk about actual warfare is that the integration of cyber with operations really amplifies the strength of both. And you have to do them together. If you try to do either one independently, you're probably not going to be successful. Um, I mentioned cybersecurity earlier and the importance of that. You can't design anything without hardening it against cyber attack. You also have to think about all the things you depend upon. Some of you in the room probably are familiar with the uh, operational imperatives that we've been using in the Department of the Air Force for the last year or so to kind of organize our work and, and define the capabilities that we need. One of them was essentially about cybersecurity. It was about investigating all the things we depend upon to go to war. That's our personnel system, our medical system, our transportation system, our logistics system. A lot of these things are connected to the commercial internet and they're part of the national infrastructure. So you have to think about all those things, as well as all the weapon systems you build and everything they're connected to for any function that they happen to have, including, for example, maintenance. Uh, so it's, it's a ubiquitous problem. It cuts across everything. And there's no part of warfare that I can imagine where the use of cyber can't potentially enhance the other things or strengthen the other things you're trying to do and vice versa. Mm. So you have to think about them together. It, it's, it's, it's inherent now in everything that we're doing. And that's a transformation in the last 20 years, so I would say. So I think we're relearning um, after two decades of uh, you know, violent extremist organizations and counterterrorism, the importance of encryption. I mean, I mean this is a, a fundamental thing that we do. At the National Security Agency, no one makes code or breaks code better than our agency in the world. And we're learning that again in terms of our service. Our most sensitive communications, our most lethal weapons platforms have to be enabled by world-class encryption. And, and that's, I think, really to the, the point that all the service secretaries have been very, very supportive. Let me I would make that, oh, sorry, I was gonna add one thing. Secretary Austin, I think, will talk about integrated deterrence. Um, and it's kind of the heart of our strategy. So it extends to our partners, too. Uh, we, we, we will fight as a, as a coalition, if you will, or as an alliance in any operation I can think we would do. The United States will not fight alone. So we have to have our partners integrated in this, too. And they have to be cyber secure enough to be able to operate with us. Mm. So it extends beyond, beyond just our own capabilities and our even and our connection to, uh, to, you know, to our support functions. I was going to make the point that uh, in some ways we have to stop thinking about cyber as its own thing. Yeah. Uh, and that whether that's in the warfighting domain or as a technology set, uh, if you think about it, cyber and AI are in a collision course. Uh, they, they'll become one and the same uh, if they haven't already. We can't fight in space without cyber and AI at the same time because the lag times are just too significant. Uh, if you think about uh, quantum, uh, post-quantum encryption, it's going to revolutionize a lot of things, and General Nicholson knows more about this than, than anybody. Uh, and even when you really start developing new systems, uh, right? I mean, the best time to put an alarm system in your house is when your house is getting built. The SecOps, the best time to actually build a secure system is to build it when you're coding the first time around. And so we really have to continuously think about cyber as an integrated element of everything we do. It's such a good point, and, and, and in addition to what just Secretary Kendall said about working with other countries, because I think what we're seeing in private sector and even across governments is great variance in terms of how they think about that. We just saw, for example, the attack in Australia that some people believe was because they haven't given these kinds of issues the, the weight of it that you all are talking about doing as well. And so I wonder how you do that cooperation, how you do that integration when the spectrum of sort of engagement on this, on this topic is so varied. You made the 
you use the term cooperation, and that we really haven't touched on that. This is an international issue. Right. One of the most important initiatives of the administration uh, was the creation of a, of a cyber bureau in the st State Department. Uh, the head of it is an amazing guy named, named Fick, from Maine, by the way. Uh, uh, but he has other qualifications. Uh, but, but the point is, this is a, uh, all the countries have an interest in this. And I've always felt, for example, sanctions are more effective if they're multilateral than if they're unilateral. I want, I want a cyber actor not be able to go to Monte Carlo or Paris as well as Miami or New York. And also setting of standards internationally is something that is, is terribly important. The Chinese have been very aggressive on these standard setting bodies that are sort of technical and, and, and boring and we have been, not been participating actively. This new bureau uh, at the Department of State and, and I'm hoping that part of the National Defense Act will be something called the Cyber Diplomacy Act, which will establish this office in the State Department on an ongoing basis, not just one administration, uh, because I think this is so important. This, 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 is a, this is not only our problem, it's everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. You extend that even further, the CHIPS Act, which we just passed, um, is partly about secure microelectronics. Cybersecurity starts with the basic devices that you have to have. And so access to reliable microelectronics, which we're confident of the content, is a part of this equation also. I want to end with um, a question about Ukraine, because I think that is obviously the, the uh, dominant issue of um, today. Um, and this comes from a member of our audience who asks, how have changes in Russia's cyber attacks in the war in Ukraine updated your views on how to ensure the resilience of U.S. allies' critical infrastructure in a protracted, um, in a protracted conflict? What is it? What have we learned that, that teaches us about protecting not only infrastructure, but um, uh, infrastructure under attack in this kind of warfare? I begin with the public sector. As I mentioned earlier, this is, this is how we get to scale. This is how we are able to shine a light on really bad tradecraft behavior, malware, ransomware, et cetera, is by sharing it with the public sector. This is, this is dramatically different, and I you think mean that- the, You mean the private sector? The private sector, correct, yeah. I'm sorry. And, and this really is the, this is the, the piece that has changed so much in terms of where we can go in the future. And are you confident the private sector can, pr can protect its own infrastructure enough to hold that information and not have second and third order effects? Um, so, so this is the give and get, right? This is the, the working with government that has insights about what our adversaries are doing and also being able to provide the information that they're seeing as well. Hmm. One of our Solarium proposals was something called the Joint Collaborative Environment. It was set up a, a structure where you could have the federal agencies, FBI, NSA, Cybercom, CISA, DHS, and the private sector as a place to come together, a kind of safe forum uh, on these issues. And, and we're not quite there yet, but I think that's, that's an important next step in terms of our setting up our structure. I, I ought to mention CISA and Jen Easterly, uh, and also Chris English, the National yeah. Cyber Director. Uh, Ann Newberger at the National Security Council. That's the that triumvirate is the is the is, is really an extraordinary group of people. And CISA has done a great job. And I saw it in 2016. We had secretaries of state. They didn't want anything to do with CISA. They were you know we're okay. Leave us alone. And Chris Krebs developed and remember I, I used the word trust. Developed a relationship of trust with the secretaries of state around election security. And now CIS is doing the same thing with the private sector where they've got a program called, I love it, it's called Shields Up, helping the private sector to, to deal with these kinds of issues. So that's where I think, as I said at the very beginning, we're looking at new kinds of combinations of, of uh, relationships that are, that are going to be critical if we're going to be able to, to navigate this problem. I want to go back to what General Nakasone said earlier a little bit. Uh, one of the things that's been critical in Ukraine is the ability to flow information to the Ukrainians. Their force has been much more successful because of that. We can't go into many details here about this, but the foresight General Nakasone and his team had and their ability to be agile and adaptive and to take advantage of the private sector have made all the difference in the world. And we, there's an enormous amount to learn from that. And, and we could do much better, I think, even going forward with our partners if we're, if we're ready to use some of those tools. Well, you know, we began this discussion with, a, with um, a survey about people wanting to understand cybersecurity more, their concerns about it, and ways that we could talk about it in a more forthright way. And I hope that this panel has gone um, towards that. And I just want to ask the audience to join me in thanking everyone for such an engaging conversation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.
and gentlemen, this concludes panel two. Panel four will begin in five minutes in the Air Force One Pavilion. Panel five will begin in five minutes on this stage. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The panel session is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The panel session is about to begin.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The panel session is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to panel five. I want you restoring confidence and recruiting the military we need. Please welcome to the stage, Ms. Dana Perino of Fox News and our distinguished panelists. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, there we go. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, I see a couple of old friends. Oh, wow, I, I, I have a new colleague and former colleague here, which is great, but a lot of friends in the room as well. It's wonderful to be at the Reagan Center. It's such an amazing venue for a really important event like this. And I think that this panel in particular is um, very interesting to not only those of us in the room, but our, our country, our citizens, and our allies, and possibly even our enemies. Um, just a moment here for me to introduce you. Da uh, General David Berger is the Commandant of the US Marine Corps and the Honorable Gilbert Cisneros. He is the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. You all probably know Senator Tammy Duckworth and Congressman Mike Gallagher. So welcome to all of you. One of the great things that the Reagan Defense Forum does is provide us data and research, and you can't fix or adjust what you don't measure, and so now we have some of these measurements, and on this, in, on this one in particular, I think it's important to point out a couple of slides from that will help describe and set up the conversation. If we could pull up the slide here about reasons for decreased confidence in the military, okay? Um, the slide, you know, it takes a long time to build up trust and it can be lost pretty quickly. In the last four years, trust in the military has gone from, from in the 70, 70% to now in the high 40s. That, that's a precipitous drop. I think that's very concerning and we're going to talk about why and what we do about it to try to make it better. But one of the things here that you'll see is that if you just look at the great deal or sum of concern about why the, res the respondents believe that they have a decreased confidence in the military, first of all, uh, so-called woke practices undermining military effectiveness. You have also concern about far right-wing extremists serving in the military. That's a little bit less to a lesser extent than the wokeism. Uh, military leadership being overly politicized. You have also, I thought this one was an important one to keep in mind, is the performance and confidence of presidents as a commander in chief. So all of those things are apparently leading to people having a decreased confidence in the military. And then this, this next slide is something that is also something very important and something that uh, the Commandant and uh, the Honorable Cisn uh, Gail Cisneros will talk about, and that is who's willing to join. And I thought this was very interesting, right? They extremely willing to join is at 6%, very willing 7%, and then it, you know, right there in the middle, but not willing at all at 26%. And maybe, I, and I'll ask you to start, uh, General, is that, in, in your perspective, the scope and scale of the problem, how do you describe it? You wrote a really great piece, I, can't, I didn't bring it with me, um, but it was a, a longer piece describing what the problem is, your concern about it, and you advocated for some bold changes, but maybe let's just start with, how do you see the scope and scale of the problem? Uh, for propensity, I would say uh, context matters. 
Um, I was on recruiting duty in the mid 80s and I came in the, the Marine Corps in the late 70s. So probably like a lot of people in the room, you see, you see a change over time. A snapshot one year, uh, helpful to understand if you put it in context. I think propensity has always been a challenge, regardless of the economy, regardless of what's going on in the world. But there is clearly a cycle of when the nation is involved in a conflict and everybody's focused, attention on their awareness is up. That's uh, a high point. And then in between conflicts, it drops off, either because they're not aware of the military, don't know anyone in the military, uh, or because things they see they don't like. So I think it's absolutely something we should pay attention to. It's not something we should hit the panic button on, but we should absolutely pay attention. This is what the recruiting force does. Okay, and I will encourage them. They can talk amongst themselves yeah. as well. I don't have to be the, uh, no. the go-to every single time, but we will kick it off this way and then mix up a little bit. Mr. Secretary, what do you think? Uh, you know, I think the Commandant was right on when he said there, there's a, a civilian military divide. Uh, less and less people uh, know somebody who served in the military. Uh, you know, my dad served, my uncle served, my grandfather served. Uh, to me, it was something that they all did, and, and, but that's becoming less and less. Um, you know, I think the thing that we need to get out there is to really get out there and share our story and really where we can work with Congress is to put out this message of, of service and the benefits of service. And, and that's one of the things, you know, hopefully going into next year, we'll be able to start working with the Congress on the HASC and the, the SASC about really getting after how do we get this message out of service to the country and whether it be you know and, and some other thing that they can do publicly or, or really serving in the military but we have to be able to get out there and tell our story and the benefits of service and, and how it's really changed lives it changed mine and i know it can do the same thing for others senator um, I think we have shrunk our pool of people that we go to to recruit from over time and I think that we need to re-expand that pool. Um, yes, there is this, there is a, a growing trend in our society where you have the military families and the non-military families. So the military families keep serving over and over again, that's where we go to. But there are folks that in the past, like say DACA uh, uh, recipients, uh, uh, you used to be able to gain citizenship from serving in the military, and we stopped that. Uh, I, I think there are people who are eager and do want to serve but don't have the opportunity to serve. I've talked to recruiters and they'll say, and I, I say, well, how, how many have you turned down? You know, people who want to serve, could serve, could pass the ASVAP test, could do all of that, but, but they're DACA. Um, and they turn away a lot of folks. So I think that we've shrunk our recruiting pool so much that um, we, we keep going back to the same well. And we need to look at expanding that, expanding that pool. But there is this trend within our society. It's not just with the military. It's also we're seeing this also with people who uh, go into professions other than ones that require a college degree. Right? For so long, every child graduated in high school. The mark of success out of high school is did you get accepted into a college? Uh, right now, we need more people who can work as machinists. We need more people in manufacturing, all of that. And we're actually trying to grow that workforce in manufacturing in the same way. So that trend is, is across society, it's not just with military. It's, that's a really interesting point. And just last week, I can't remember if it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal had a big feature story on the front page about how major companies in America like IBM are rethinking their requirements for, because they are looking for the talent pool as well to want to join. So it's a really interesting point. Yeah. Congressman? Well, there's no, uh, there's no baseline to compare the propensity numbers against. So you kind of got to go to the so-called jammers uh, survey, that's the youth survey DOD does. And if you look at that, what we're seeing is that we're at the lowest level for propensity since 2007. And if you dig into the cross tabs to see why people don't have as much of a propensity to serve, they cite fear of physical injury and fear of psychological and emotional harm, which really makes no sense relative to 2007, right? In other words, in 2007, that can make some sense. I mean, things are pretty bad in Iraq at that point. Um, you, if you join the Marine Corps at that time, you're pretty well guaranteed to go fight uh, in Iraq. Uh, that's not the case today. So there's something bigger going on that's upstream of military policy. I will say, however, uh, I completely agree with what the Senator said about um, uh, college and uh, really the cultural issue 
we can for I'll hear people in my district all the time say, not every kid needs to go to college, right? We got great jobs. You can make 75 grand a year welding here, there. And I'll say, well, what about your kids? And they'll say, well, my kids are going to college, right? Because it's still that stigma associated with. So that's part of it. Uh, I would submit that if 33% if of 16 to 28 year olds are not going to get the vaccine, that the vaccine mandate has to play uh, a role there. Uh, we're gonna be considering that policy this week and certainly in the next uh, Congress. Um, I think it's great. The Commandant's article was fantastic. It was the boldest thing I've seen written on this subject. I might disagree a little bit about the role of retention in terms of a, a solution because retention, if you lean on that too heavily, you got an older force and wars a young man and women's game. Um, but I do think we, the fact we have senior leaders, I saw Secretary Kendall uh, in the green room, we had uh, SECNAV, Secretary Kendall, Secretary of the Army out there with a the joint op-ed, that's great. We need senior leaders in the Pentagon, including the SECDEF and the DEPSECDEF going to middle America, talking about this issue, talking about the value of service, talking about the challenge associated with service. And in some ways, and I'll shut up after this, I think the message actually, it'd be more effective if it's less about an inclusive environment, right? Because the military, in some level, is an exclusive challenge. We have an all-volunteer force. We want the best and the brightest in our military. And I think that certainly what was appealing to me when I considered joining the Marine Corps, and the, probably the best example of that in terms of Marine Corps recruiting was the infamous Lava Monster recruiting commercial in 1998, right? It's this <laughs> crazy thing that seems almost comical in retrospect, but it inspired a lot of people around the idea that, okay, this is a massive challenge and I want that challenge. So I think there are ways we can fix it, but right now the all volunteer force is in jeopardy because of the recruiting numbers we're seeing. I, I do want to touch on retention a little bit though. Sure. I think that we don't do a good job of asking people who leave after their first enlistment why they're leaving. Um, and because we need to try to retain those guys, right? Those are the folks who oftentimes they haven't made E5, right? They're, they're leaving after that first term. And I, I would like to know why they're leaving because retaining those folks are important. Sure. The, young, the, the folks are gonna become the young NCOs and um, I, I, I would love to dig into those numbers more. Yeah, I was also reading about um, on, in terms of retention, especially if you have two, uh, a couple, a married couple serving in the military, uh, if one gets promoted, uh, well, maybe they'll have to leave, but does one have to retire? How do they move together? And some of the changes there I thought were interesting, especially for um, spouses who are working maybe outside of the military. Can we help them as well? I know there's some push on that. I do, I do want to ask, General, when you hear, when you see something in the survey results that says that people um, are concerned about wokeism in the military, how does that read to you? Like, what do you think they are saying? How, that could be, you could have lots of different definition, but what does it mean to you? Probably the best way to answer it, I would say, when you go to visit units, and uh, the Secretary was telling me last week he was at Camp Pendleton during Thanksgiving, like many people do, uh, helping out, feeding in the chow hall. The, the way to answer the, the question, you know, how do you feel about it, is how do, the, how do the Marines feel about it? How do the soldiers, sailors, airmen, how do they feel about it? I don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't, they're not talking about it. It's not a factor for them at all. It's important, I think, in a survey you know, to pay attention to, but I, I don't know about you all, but I don't see uh, a conversation or an impact of wokeism in the rank and file at all. You've written about it a lot, Congressman. What do you think? Uh, I, I disagree somewhat. Well, first of all, let's just have the like a little bit of humility with these numbers, right? The survey is very valuable, but 14% of respondents say North Korea is an ally. 7% say <laughs> Australia is an enemy. I mean, this survey shows a, a great deal of trust in Congress going up. I mean, granted, from 5 to 9%, but <laughs> hey, we're headed in the right direction. Uh, the media is right behind you. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they used to trust cockroaches more yeah, than Congress right, a few right. years back. So Those McCain's things as, as staffers and blood relatives. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, unpack the top three issues cited in terms of a great deal. Politicization of military leadership, uh, presidential performance and wokeness. So the first two are evenly distributed among Democrats and Republicans, roughly. So you can't just say it's, you know, uh, Republican Fox News watchers skewing the data, right? And that makes sense, because we've had both parties in recent years have recently retired generals speak at political conventions, calling the other party's nominee a national security threat. 
Both parties have changed the law in recent years to allow recently retired generals to serve as Secretary of Defense after not having done so for 67 years. We've had conspicuous incidents like the Lafayette Square debacle. And then on presidential performance, Afghanistan has to be playing part of, of, of that story, right? I mean, uh, the, the way in which the so-called logistical success of our surrender to terrorists in Afghanistan played out. I, I can, I, what I'm saying is I can construct a, a narrative uh, for both of those top two variables. The third one, wokeness, right? So that it does skew Republican. But if you add up some degree and great degree, that's 50% of respondents saying woke policies are an issue. So you can debate the value of DEI programs. You can debate whether they contribute to lethality. But I don't think it's debatable that it is a problem. It is happening. There are hundreds of examples of this happening in the military, and I am hearing it. I'm hearing it from constituents that are on active duty or have families in the military. So again, reasonable people can debate the value of the growing DEI bureaucracy, but there's no question as to whether it is growing in the military and that Americans are concerned about it, albeit a greater number of Republicans than Democrats. The, uh, the survey this year asked more detailed questions from what I recall in years before, which I thought, like you pointed out, really helpful. Mm -hmm. So on propensity, in the pages when you flip it back and they break it down by gender, by age, then you, especially in the age category, um, I, I may be off by a percentage or two, but the population like 30 years and below is 11% higher than last year. That's a good thing, right? That means 11% of the recruitable population sees, is more propensity than they were the year before. Some of that could be kids back in high school seeing recruiters that they didn't see when they were at home. It could be a lot of things, but I, there are trends that are moving, I think, in the right direction. The, the, the breakdown in, in a greater degree of specificity really helpful, I think. Mr. Secretary, what about your perspective? You know, I. Again, I, I was just at uh, Naval Station San Diego, and I went down to Miramar to visit the Marines and the sailors down there in the San Diego area, and I, I've talked to soldiers and, and, and airmen and guardians all over, and, you know, they're always coming to me about, like, their things, they're, they're worried about their families, right? How can we take care of the families? How can we do that? And, uh, you know, they want to know how we can improve the EFMP programs, you know, how can we take care of our, our health care? Uh, these are the issues that they're talking to me, and you know, when we're on DEIA, it's to me that's providing opportunity. Um, how do we provide opportunities to individuals for them to go out and to succeed? And and it's individuals, no matter where they might come from, right? We want to have diversity of geography, diversity of thought. You know, women are becoming a bigger part of our force, and we need to make sure that they are given the opportunity to su succeed. And, and really, that is what we're doing with diversity is out there. It's about creating opportunity. It's not about creating some type of um, culture there that it's going to ensure that we're keeping people down, but really about creating opportunity. And these are the things that people want. They want the opportunity to succeed. They want to know that they we're going to take care of their families, and that's continuing what I'm hearing. Would any of you want to comment on, on the other sides of that coin that in the, in the survey so-called far-right or extremist individuals serving in the military, um, if you take a great deal in some, that's at 46% saying that they think that's one of the reasons there's a decrease in the military. I'll open it up to anybody. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, it is sort of, so it skews Democrat in the way that the wokeism numbers skew Republican. Right. Right? So the question then is, is it true, right? Is it true that the military has a problem with far-right extremists, right? What do the numbers actually say? Well, the Senate, in a bipartisan fashion, actually concluded after looking into this uh, issue that for the military to keep burning resources on examining exceedingly rare cases of extremism was a waste of taxpayer dollars and should be discontinued immediately. The Secretary's Counter Extremism Working Group, which relies on something called the Pyrus data set, uh, the numbers are basically that there are 0.007% in terms of cases of far-right extremism. If you average it over time, it's actually 0.000%. 1%, and then you go a layer deeper, you see bad social science lurking in the background here, like in most things. The data set omits 17,000 cases in the summer of 2020. If only a fraction of those were included, it would show a declining uh, uh, relative amount of extremism relative to the general population. The implication being 
We should look to the military for advice on how we control rising extremism in an overall more radicalized society, right? And finally, to connect it to their overall topic of this panel, which is declining trust in the military and propensity and all these things. Think about the effect that has. If you, if you were thinking about joining the military and you opened up a newspaper, if you opened up the New York Times in the beginning of February 2021, you would have seen a headline that said, Secretary Austin ramps up uh, fight against far-right extremists in the military. So if you open that and you saw the headline, you would conclude, my gosh, the military is filled with a bunch of far-right extremists. Except empirically, that's not true. Now, our goal could, should be zero, for sure. And there are ways in which the cultural war comes from the right just as bad as it comes from the left. But that headline and that narrative, I think, is very damaging, particularly when we're in the midst of the biggest recruiting crisis since the creation of the all-volunteer force. And, you know, I, I would have to say the perception is that's a problem we have right now. We need to be talking about what is keeping parents from encouraging their children to serve and what is keeping the population of young people 18 to 24 from looking to the military as an avenue for them to pursue uh, you know, the next steps in life after high school. Um, and I do think that uh, just as my colleague talked about this, you know, he talked about the headline with Secretary Austin, the flip side of that is seeing General Milley walking behind President Trump who just cleared Lafayette Square of, of peaceful protesters and then holding up, you know, and standing in front of, of uh, a church with a Bible that he borrowed from someone. So we need to stop that on both sides, right? We need to stop that. We need to make sure the military remains apolitical, make that clear, but then we gotta go back. We gotta go back to what is it that parents are seeing? What messages are parents receiving? What messages are young people receiving? Why are they not, when they're looking at, when they're doing their search pattern of what do I do after high school, why is the military not one of those things? And, and there's a number of reasons. One of the things that used to be, that the military used to offer was, this was a great place for you to go spend some time and get good training that was gonna be useful to you in your career field post-military. And I don't hear that as much, unless you become a help, unless, be, unless you become a pilot. Then, you know, that's, that's sort of a pathway to the airlines, right? But if you're not becoming a pilot, you don't hear people saying the way my father's generation did that, hey, enlisting is a great stepping stone towards a career afterwards, and you're gonna get great skills in the military. So there's all sorts of factors that go into why people are not looking at the military as one of the viable avenues post high school graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's talking to the parents, it's making sure that we keep the military apolitical, but it's also really not selling, but, but showing to the American public what a stint in the military does for, you, for a young person. It allows them to mature, grow, they gain lots of great experiences. They're gonna be ahead of their peers when they come out in terms of a job you know, career field, all of that. That I don't think we're doing a good job of messaging to the this American is, people. Uh, I, I agree, this is key. We talk about service and what it does for the country, but yeah. service, what it does for the individual, the way yeah. you all are talking about is what we have to talk about more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, in some cases, it's a skill that will translate into later in life. But for, I would say, for my background, for most, it's, intangible values, it's, it's uh, self-discipline, it's, it's the parts that will make them successful later on, no matter what they do, mm -hmm. that they're gonna pick up when they serve, and when they get out, whether it's four years or later, that, that's gonna translate, and everybody wants to hire those people. They're better citizens, they're better employees. And the, the second part I would say is, uh, although most people in America would probably understand it as an all-volunteer force, it's an all-recruited force. In other words, the, the role of the recruiter and the translation to coaches and teachers and people in the community is huge. And we lost two years of that uh, due to the pandemic. That will cycle back where all those people in the communities and the schools will be very familiar with military people again. And the influencers that affect the high school kids, you know, thinking are back in play again. I think it will settle itself out. Yeah, you know, I, I met a, a young airman and I asked him, what is your number one? So what are you doing in, in the Air Force? He says, I, I'm doing HVAC. And I thought, wow, this is, we're giving you a career. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a skill that you're going to have 
whether you stay in four years or you stay in 20 years, you know, doing this, the, you're going to have a job and, and a career that you're going to be able to go and, and take advantage of for the rest of your life. Uh, and, and it's a good career. Um, and these are the stories that I say we need to get out and tell more, right? And, and we need to counter these, these narratives. The, the, the extreme vast majority of people in our military are doing it right. You know, every once in a while there's a bad apple. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're, we're taking care of those, those situations, right? And we're doing the training to let people know what needs to be done right and, and what's the proper way to act. And that's what we're doing. But, you know, we understand and we know the vast majority of people are doing it right. And we need to tell those stories and we need to get back to telling the benefit of service and how it can affect that individual. On America's Newsroom, Bill and I recently reported on a survey of young people and what, and what they said that they wanted to do when they grow up. Like, what do they want to be? And I imagine that they don't think that military service is going to help them become a TikTok influencer. Which is what a lot of them said that they wanted to really wanted to be. Um, to, we should have a TikTok channel too at some point, maybe. Um, I, I am curious, General, if you could talk about the concerns of is there a concern about our readiness because of these things that we're talking about now? Uh, in in one word, no. Readiness of the forces as uh, we have them that need to deploy, need to be prepared for deploy. They are, as Secretary Austin said, they are the best I have ever served alongside. I have no doubts in their performance at all. They're not distracted. They know what their focus is, uh, no question. So we should pay attention to recruiting and propensity because that's what comes in the door, absolutely. But in terms of readiness of the force, I am absolutely 100% confident that this force we have right now, best I have ever served in. Yeah. You know, I, it's personnel and readiness, right? So readiness is a big part of what we do, making sure that we are ready today, or we're modernizing for the future. And, and you know, the comment said it, we are ready to meet, meet any significant challenge that's out there. Our forces are ready, and, and we have the best and the brightest in our military today. Well, I, I am concerned about readiness. I, I, I agree that our, our force um, is ready to move to and engage with our, the enemies of our nation as we ask them to. Um, but I worry that we're not sustaining that readiness the way we should, um, which is why I continue to vote for higher budgets uh, for the DOD than gets asked on, under both Democratic and Republican administrations. But I also think that we need to make better investments in the troops once they're in as well. We still have a percentage of young enlisted who are food insecure. Imagine being food insecure and you're in uniform. Um, uh, and, and we're not talking about the young, you know, uh, E2 who went out and bought a Camaro, with, you know, right? Um, um, or got himself in hock for tattoos, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, but we're talking about the fact is those people that are enlisted in our military have changed. They're not young, single people. There are families trying to live on something less than an E5 salary. And we have a military hunger issue that we need to address with. We have an issue with a uh, leave policy for female service members. So, so there are things that we should be doing that we are addressing. Um, and I will tell you in a bipartisan way, at least in the Senate, uh, that will make things better. Um, so that readiness, the training, I don't worry about. The, the equipping, all of that is, is um, uh, something that we do very, very well. But I do worry that we're not sustaining the readiness in terms of their personal lives and the lives of their family members, because that's what's going to cause them to quit when they're, in, when they're a young E4, because my kid's hungry and I'm happy to go to the food pantry. You, you know, the fact is, outside of bases now, not only do you have you know, you know the, 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 the pawn shops and the tattoo places, you now have a food pantry outside a lot of military bases, and that's simply wrong. Um, I, I, when it comes to our, our paramount national security challenge, I, I, do, I do not have confidence that we are capable of deterring, let alone winning, a war uh, with China over Taiwan. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm always a bad guy on these panels. I'm always a downer. Uh, but, uh, and I think there's plenty of evidence to support that claim. I mean, you always read about the war games that we get our butts kicked and, and handed to us. You can quibble with 
how those are, those are constructed and the assumptions are built upon. But I think directionally, uh, that's right. We've had a, a series of high profile accidents, uh, peacetime accidents that call into question our, our warfighting prowess. Uh, we've had ships colliding with merchant vessels. We've had ships being lit on fire. We've had you know plane crashes, things like that. All of this to me suggests that when it comes to our foremost challenge, which is deterring a war with a great power competitor, the system is blinking red. Uh, and I don't think sugarcoating that uh, helps us uh, in any way. And just to compare it to, or pay, perhaps try to connect it to some of the stuff we're talking about. It's amazing that the military provides economic opportunities for people, provides a skill set that they can get uh, a great civilian job afterwards. Uh, that's something I didn't appreciate uh, when I joined. But at the end of the day, it's about warfighting. That's the business we're in, right? The military exists to fight wars and prepare to fight future wars. To quote MCDP-1, warfighting that the Commandant and I live by. I mean, if a, a military activity does not contribute to fighting a war, it can only be justified if it, it contributes to preparing for a possible future war. Anything else should be viewed with great skepticism. And that, I think, is where it's fair to criticize uh, some of the DEI initiatives, right? They layer on another bureaucracy on top of a force that is already heavily bureaucratized and necessarily sap resources from the military's core warfighting functions. And the final thing I say, if you look at the poll, I think there's actually a, a positive story to tell because the American people have high confidence in our ability to still get after some of those core war fighting functions, they're just more concerned about the political stuff. So Secretary Duckworth, I mean, Senator, maybe Secretary Duckworth at some point, uh, <laughs> was right to suggest that we need to get out of the politics and focus on that core war fighting imperative, because that's what the military does at the end of the day. You know, I, I, our military is focused on the war fighting. You know, uh, we have the national defense strategy that's out there. China is the pacing threat. Uh, we are working towards that. We are training towards that. And that is where the focus is. Uh, again, DEIA, for us, it's about creating opportunity. And how do we do that for individuals? And I think it's about creating uh, an atmosphere and a culture there where, where we bring in different minds of thought. You know, the, we're geographical diversity, right, that we just don't have one train of thought, you know, this is the way, only way to do it, right? We want to bring in different ideas. You know, I'm sure the Commandant, you know, is appreciative when he can get good ideas from the corporals and the Lance Corporals that are down there, right. you know, giving him thoughts about, hey, how can we do things better? And, and that is what we're looking for and that's what we're doing. Maybe, I don't know if this is a quick question or not, but it comes to mind, I feel like, because we have just gone through a pandemic, and do you think that the COVID mandate will change at all, and would that make a difference for you, Mr. Secretary? You know, I, again, the mandate has shown that we know that the vaccines have been effective. Um, it has, it's kept people alive. It's kept people out of the hospital. 98% of our, our active duty force is, is vaccinated, and, and it's played a role in ensuring that you know, our force is ready. Um, you know, ready, readiness comes in many forms, right? Uh, it, it's, we have to look at readiness as, you know, the health of the individual service member is a big part of our readiness, that they're gonna be able to go and, and go into combat and do their mission when they need it. And all the vaccines that we have, that, that we ensure that our service members get, play a role in that and ensuring that they're able to go out and do their mission. Anybody else wanna comment on that? No. Okay. We have we have nine vaccines that we require of everybody that comes in the military, all for the same reason. They're tied to readiness the way the, the way the congressman said that that's what you need to maintain a, a healthy unit that can deploy on ship, ashore. It doesn't matter. Uh, where it is having an impact for sure is on recruiting. Where parts of the country there there's still myths and misbeliefs about the backstory behind it, and it's. It's still having an, an impact in certain areas of the country on recruiting. recruiting. But inside the force, we probably peaked last winter in terms of getting the, all of the force vaccinated. We have, and we had some service members die dur during that first probably 15, 18 months. We haven't had anybody die since April, zero. Right. You just go out 100% vaccinated, ready. It's, it's critical to make sure we can do our job. Right. We've, we've had. 96 service members pass away because of COVID. COVID. 93 of them were not fully vaccinated. 
Congressman, did you want to say anything? Well, I, so, I think one, I said this to someone else, actually, actually, I think it's a lawful order. I don't think that that's a close call. I, now, I think it's imprudent based on what we know about this strain of the virus and the fact that it's endemic and unnecessary. We don't need to argue about that. I think one le legitimate criticism is that there, the, the current status of, for vaccination policy is really disjointed, right? And that, some of that is because it, there are now legal issues involved. DOD contractors have one set of rules. DOD civilians have another set of rules, which differs from the Army rules, which differs from the Navy rules, right? The Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Space Force, I think right now are under a legal prohibition from dismissing those who request a religious exemption, but the Army is under no such prohibition right now. So all of that, I think, creates confusion. And then the raw numbers, I think, we've dismissed 7,834-ish last time I checked. That's like two Army brigades, I, I think. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. Right, and when we need when we need people, so I'm not saying it. I think the order was lawful. I'm not quite there on the readiness argument, but there is a lot of confusion out there okay. right now. I was also really struck by the percentages. I believe this was in your op-ed about how many people that we have that might come to our recruiting office that couldn't pass the physical fitness test and would be immediately, you know, like encouraged if they want to join the military that you're going to have to go and try to get fit. I mean, how big a problem is that? And are other are any of our other allies? dealing with this as well, or is that mainly an American problem? I don't know about our allies. That's a great question. Um, it's, I think the, the statistics, the evidence is there that our society is getting more obese, getting more out of shape. Of course, we're drawn from society, so it's going to affect us. The way, how do you, you know, how do you address that? Back to the recruiting force. They, they become that person's like physical trainer, uh, <laughs> mentor, everything that's gone, that's the beginning of their military career. The, not all of us were in great shape when we first talked to a recruiter either. Right. But the recruiter made sure, hey, before you go off, I'm gonna make sure that you are prepared. But it is, bad, it is not a good signal for all of society to become fatter. I mean, that can't be healthy for the nation at all. I was also curious about, there's so much more widespread marijuana use now across the country like if you come to new york god bless you it's, it's, it's horrendous you smell it on ev everywhere you go and it's at all times of the day in, in the morning the afternoon the evening it's all, everywhere and i know that president biden and even president trump are being pressured to try to lift um, any sort of prohibitions from getting a top secret clearance if you have marijuana use in your system but i just i'm curious if you think that is a problem if it's one that needs to be solved or is it just what it is maybe Senator? Well, I mean, right now it's, it's still not a fully legal drug. I, I, I just feel like when you join the military, you know, you can't be drunk all the time, either, right. right? So so I think there are, there are uh, legitimate uh, parameters that, that you can impose. Um, I don't really see cannabis as, as, as the issue that's affecting recruiting. I'm, I'm more worried about all of the 18 to 24 year olds who can't pass the ASVAB test, you know, who can't pass the basic entrance examination that's written at the eighth grade level and can't right. basic eighth grade math and English. That's what I'm worried about. Um, and that's a national trend also. And we need to talk about the investments we should be making as a nation into our educational system so that either high school graduates or GED holders can actually pass the ASVAB test. That's a great point. I think if I don't remember the numbers, but I think the biggest source of disqualification, the Commonwealth probably does, is is the obesity issue, and that's mm -hmm. a huge problem for all the reasons you laid out, General. And then ASVAP is second. Is it? Yeah. And then uh, up there is psychological and emotional issues, mm -hmm. right? And that that's got to be correlated with substance abuse, right? It's hard for me to disentangle all those. I mean, you mentioned TikTok. We should ban TikTok, by the way, but we don't need to talk about that. Uh, uh, I mean, just think about the corrosive effect of some of the kids just spending their whole life. Uh, that's got it. That's got to also impact physical fitness, right? If you if you spend all day online and not got to be a dancing. Yes, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Maybe there's a solution. Just got to get the algorithm make right. Our own, so, make our own. TikTok. Somebody call Bite Dance and ask. Yeah. Them. We've had some great questions come in from the audience, and this is an interesting one. Uh, did the military brack itself into pro into a propensity problem with fewer communities with a military-based presence? Does that affect recruitment? I hadn't thought about it, but maybe so. Uh, I'll, I'll let him chime in. I don't, I don't think you can connect BRAC to uh, demographics in terms of recruiting. 
But there is clearly shifts in demographics in the U.S. that is affecting recruiting. And I, I haven't seen anything. I don't know the evidence. I, I don't know a correlation between BRAC and closing bases. But clearly, if there's not a military presence in your community, you're not going to know anything about it. And if the only thing you know about it is what you see on the news, it may not be good. So our presence in every zip code really, really important. I, I, I think uh, you know definitely. I, I think we need to have a presence there. And I think um, you know, as the commandant had mentioned earlier about getting out into the schools, right, with the recruiters. Um, you know, I talked to a young sailor and I asked her what made you join, and she. She said it was that recruiter, that one-on-one -on -one contact that she had with her recruiter, and uh, and there, and that's what we need to do. And I think uh, the pandemic has kind of stopped and prevented that from happening a lot. But uh, being able to make that one-on-one -on -one contact is still our biggest um, advantage that we have of bringing people into the military. Um, you know, if I can just go back to the last question real quick. You know, I, I think the Army has a great program that they are piloting right now about. Um, you know, those, those individuals that want to join, right, but they're not quite up to physical fitness standards or they're not quite hitting the score there on the ASVAB. They're now taking them and they're doing kind of like a pre-boot camp with them where they're getting them into shape and they're working on their academic skills. Wow. And they're having great results with this right now is to, to help get more people in. That's, a, that's very encouraging. Yeah. I, I would think that, I, I would like to know if there's a correlation over time um, between the reduction in JROTC programs in high schools and ROTC programs in colleges yeah. and recruiting, because I, I think that that exposure is um, a valuable one. It certainly and stands for reason, sure. Yeah. There was another question here I liked, which was, Avion talked about something kind of new and exciting, and I wonder if this helps with recruitment, and the question was, what effects has the creation of the Cyber Command and Space Force had on recruitment efforts? You know, I, I think those are definitely special fields that we're going to need people in to come in and, and to serve. And I think it's just another area there where we're giving opportunity and teaching people a skill that they're going to be able to have for life. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to ensure that we bring them in and that we take advantage of them, and, or not advantage of them, but leverage their, the opportunity that they have uh, to come in there and to teach them and, and to take uh, and to leverage the skills that they develop. But I think. Uh, you know, the, the Space Force and, and the, uh, the, the cyber world and what we're doing out there is, is definitely something that we hope will attract more people in to come in to do those type of jobs. Congressman, you have anything on that? Uh, just one uh, uh, part of that. We actually, we actually in recent years uh, gave the Pentagon a lot of authority to, let's say, take someone who's really talented in the cyber world mm -hmm. and kind of have a special way to get them into the military and make them a uh, a major or a lieutenant colonel. Our, our understanding, and this could be wrong, is that the Pentagon has used that authority really at all. And it could just be because there's, I don't know, it, it doesn't work and we were wrong in kind of our theory of the case. But that's something I'd like to understand. It, what, has that not worked? Why hasn't it worked? There's got to be a bunch of people that want to serve in the military, uh, but don't necessarily want to get a high and tight and run around and, and do pull-ups and all the, the weird stuff we do in the Marine Corps. Uh, and there's got to be a way we can leverage that talent. Just uh, picking up where he left off, I mean, um, we have to do a much, we, we're going to have to change how we operate to where it's easier to move between active duty and reserve, reserve in the civilian sector, come back in. We have to make it a much more permeable uh, all-volunteer force than we have in the past. People should be able to step out for two or three or four years, come back in. We, we need to, we need to uh, look pretty creatively, and that, I think that will affect propensity as well, because more people in the community then will be aware of it, of the military, they'll have a closer tie to it. Right now, it's, those, those are not literal walls, but it's, really, it's not so easy. And what, what do you need in order to get that done? Is, that, is, it, is there a legislative angle, or uh, is it, it's all they, internal? They gave us the latitude to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's just, we, we need to adapt, we need to adjust how we, how we operate. And, you know, the Space Force is developing that model yeah. to where you know the individual can spend time on active duty, they go into the reserves, and then come back, and and, uh, and so I, I think that'll kind of be the testing ground that we see like how it works, and and it'll be something that the other services can observe and see how they can take advantage of it as well. And I will say, hey, we do appreciate the the help and support from Congress on the uh, direct hire authority that, that they've given us, and you know. Uh, when you talk
talk about the cyber force and, the, and, and those that are doing space operations, um, you know, a big part of that force, right, and we say as a total force, are our civilian personnel that are working for, for the, the services as well as the, the DOD and um, allowing us and having that opportunity to bring those people in and yeah. serve has been is something that we appreciate you know, from Congress. And it's probably not as, uh, and then you, you can press ahead, but it's probably not as understood or aware by most people that a lot of, when, when folks, some folks leave the military, the grass isn't always as green as they thought it would be. So a lot do come back in too. We have to make that easy as well. If, uh, if they got out and a year later it didn't work out and they've got skill sets that we need in, a, in an area we need, we should make it easy for them to come back in. One of the other questions um, that were coming in was about immigration. Mm. And is there a way that, <laughs> immigration is a big, huge topic and maybe not one I should bring up with eight minutes to go, but um, I was returning to the Senator and Congressman if there's there's always this feeling that there should be some sort of a way to do a comprehensive immigration reform and maybe it would include something that has to do with immigration, but it, it, perhaps that isn't on the table right now, but is, it, should it be? Should that be part of this discussion overall? Yeah, I mean, I, well, let me tell you about the bill that I have that um, I have very good bipartisan support, but it's being stopped by one person. Um, it's called the Enlist Act, and it allows anybody that's entered the United States on a valid visa, um, who has overstayed that visa for whatever reason, maybe they're the child of an H-1B visa holder and they've aged out of the system. Also DACA people would qualify um, and it would be a way for people who currently are in an undocumented status. You enlist, you, you meet all the requirements, you have to pass the ASVAB, you have to pass the medical, the background check, the five-year background check that everybody has. Um, you've already been touched by the State Department once because you had that valid visa at a previous point in time. You enlist at that point, you get what is essentially a provisional green card. Mm -hmm. At the end of your first term of enlistment, we gave, in the bill, I give the Secretary of Homeland Security the ability to revoke that green card at any time during that first term of enlistment, should they not keep their noses clean. If you serve honorably through one tour, that green card becomes permanent. Then you go to the end of the line and you wait just like everyone else and wait your turn to be able to apply for citizenship after you've waited the amount of time. We used to allow people to earn citizenship. You want to become an American? You say you love this country? Put on our colors, put on our uniform. Be willing to put your life on the line to defend this great nation. Show me you truly love and care for America. That is a valid way forward and that's a way many of our ancestors gained citizenship, by the way, in this country. Uh, but we stopped that in the early 90s. And, and so my bill, I have lots of support on both sides. There's a, there's a companion in the house, but I've got the, the ranking member of the, uh, uh, of the Judiciary Committee who says he's not letting anything on immigration move. And he considers immigration, I consider it a recruiting bill because all we're doing is just expanding that, right. but it's being seen as, as a recruiting bill. Um, on the Democratic side, it used to be dogma that we will only do comprehensive immigration reform. We're not gonna move pieces of it. Right. I will tell you as a Democrat and a Senate, we've moved away from that. We are willing to move pieces of immigration reform. And this, I think, would be one that both sides would agree on. That's a, I mean, that's a very powerful idea, I think. I, um, yeah. I, you screw up. I, <laughs> you do anything wrong. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You, and listen, my basic framework card, yeah. is legal immigration, good. Mm -hmm. Let's make that easy, transparent, illegal immigration, bad. Our system is totally broken. Yeah, it's pay, only a matter of time before yeah. we figure Don't it out. reward the cheaters. Yeah. Pay your fee, fines, penalties, whatever it is. Go to the end of the line. It's got to be doable. It's got to be fair, and it's got to be humane. One thing I had trouble making sense of: if you look at the propensity to serve numbers, this is in the the youth survey, not in the, the Reagan survey. Though the drop really comes from uh, males and from Hispanic Americans, uh, and that's something I didn't, I couldn't quite create an explanation for. I have certain, I think, ideological priors. I do think that there might be a way in which the more controversial woke policies are affecting those populations. Um, we can have that argument. I will say just on, on one point, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, the secretary or the commandant wouldn't be hearing about this from the fleet because if you're sitting there in front of the commandant of the Marine Corps, I mean, you're probably not gonna get the most unvarnished uh, answer. I could be wrong Wait, about that. Wait, I know Marines, yeah. yes he would. Not the, not the, uh, the secretary. Hi, Daddy. But Hi, Daddy. I'll, I'll just say one other thing and then the commandant can tell me, commandant can tell me why I'm wrong. The, the idea that, that 
DEIA is is a is a way is, is being sold is, is a matter of opportunity. That's actually not how it's being sold to us from Pentagon leadership. It's being explicitly sold to us as a way of improving lethality. I mean, when when Anderson Air Force Base in Guam was sending around emails saying don't use gender pronouns, they said do that because it will improve lethality. Right? We had cadets at the Air Force Academy that were being given similar guidance. There's now a minor in diversity and inclusion at the Air Force Academy. Quantico's bank spending $144,000 a year on a, a DEI uh, uh, official. That's more than we paid the base commander. It's being sold as a way to improve lethality. And I guess, I think if I could explain the Republican skepticism, such as it exists, we have yet to see any evidence that DEI programs like unconscious bias training like leveraging AI to reduce board bias, as the Navy recommended, is actually somehow going to improve lethality. If you can prove that, then you have a good case. And now we have an ocean of evidence accumulating that suggests these programs either have null impacts, no impact, or they're actively counterproductive. They increase discord, friction, and disunity. And that's the concern from, from my side, not that I speak for everyone. I, know, I can tell you what success looks like earlier this week on on your topic. Earlier this week, uh, there's a battleship in Wilmington, North Carolina from World War II that's tied up there. They had a naturalization citizenship ceremony. Oh, cool. You saw it? I don't no, know. I, no, I just, I, I used to I be saw it yesterday. I wasn't aware of it. But anyway, they have a, a citizenship ceremony on the deck of the USS North Carolina mm -hmm. from one unit, one battalion. And they're swearing in I don't know, 20, 25 people in, as US citizens from one unit, yeah. from like 11 or 12 different countries. That's what right looks like. That's good. I, one of my favorite memories of during the Bush administration was going to Walter Reed and, a, um, and there was a similar ceremony and the sacrifices were very real and obvious yeah. to see, you know, even with the, with the eye. And um, I think that your bill is really very interesting, Senator, and I would love to stay in touch with you on that. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll have the other guy who's holding it up on the show too, maybe. Who's <laughs> there? If, if I could just say one thing, um, you know, we want to ensure everybody in our military is able to serve with dignity and respect. That they are going to be treated right, and uh, everybody's going to take care of each other. And I know this is uh, Secretary Austin has made it his priorities, right? That we're going to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. Um, we want those units to be strong, right? And ensuring that we're treating with dignity and respect is going to make a stronger unit, a better unit. It is going to make them more lethal. Yeah. Um, we know that some of these problems, whether it be extremism or whether it be sexual uh, assault or harassment, can cause corrosion, mm -hmm. you know, in a unit and bring it down. And so we are working to kind of ensure that that doesn't happen. And when we know that they're, you know, on all cylinders or anything, none of these things are taking place. They are going to be stronger. They're going to be better, and they are going to be more lethal. And I, I mean, I got to say that the greater diversity is helpful and useful to the force and the lethality of the force, especially as you're looking to, you know, what the recent NDS and 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 our nearest near peer competitor, you know, with with the with China and the Indo Pacific region. I remember as a second lieutenant going through as the only. Uh, Asian only woman in my flight school class, right? And and we we got this talk like this is what you should look like, and they put up a poster, and it was like a six foot tall guy. Yeah. And I'm like with a you know with with a high intent, like I can never look like this. Mm -hmm. I would never look like this. And you're telling me from day one that I'm gonna fail because this is your ideal, and I'm never gonna look like that. Now we've come a long way in 30 years, but if we're gonna be recruiting from Gen Zs, right? then we've got to be able to also appeal to Gen Z. Um, and we've got to be able to appeal to the moms of, of women, young women who want to serve in the military, and, and, and moms and dads of young women who know that their daughters are going to become warriors, but their daughters are also not going to become victims of military sexual trauma. So there is a place for this, and, and the diversity, especially in communities that we don't normally go to. We go to the same well over and over again, going back to what I started talking about. We need to be recruiting to the Asian American and Pacific Islander population, especially the Asian American part, because Pacific Islanders have always served in uniform, but the AA, the, the Asian American part, right? We're not going to attract those folks and those families, right. right? Unless they see a greater diversity. 
And then we're going to be more effective when you go into Indonesia and Thailand and, and, and in places like that. When there are a variety of faces, when my face shows up, it makes a difference in uniform when you go to do Operation Cobra Gold. And those language skills and all of that stuff is important. So there is, it, it, it does contribute and the diversity is helpful and it is good for the readiness of the force. Just remember where we, where we were is yeah. before we start saying, let's get rid of all of it. So I always try to leave on a high note. Um, I wrote a book called And the Good News Is, partly because I was taught, well, yeah, when I worked on Capitol Hill, they said, if you go to the congressman and you have a question, um, and it's usually bad news, like, uh, Congressman, the New York Times is gonna write this really bad piece. But the good news is, like, I did something else. So uh, I'll just give you this maybe a quick little chance to give a little bit of good news about this situation with Secretary General. Oh, great point. Monday or Tuesday afternoon, uh, I'm gonna get a phone call from outer space, right to your point, from Colonel, Ma C Colonel Mann. The mission commander on the space station right now is a female Marine Corps fighter pilot astronaut. That's great. You want good news? Yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah. progress, to your point. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, your turn. No, I, I, you know, we need to get back to, to kind of countering some of the narrative that's out in the media, right, and really get and telling our story and the benefit of service and what it can do and how it can change lives. It, it, it set my life on a, a path that I never would have imagined and, and gave me uh, amounts of, of, extreme amounts of opportunity uh, to succeed out there. And I know uh, we can do the same thing for other individuals. Senator. The military is still the most highly trusted and respected institution in American society and we just have to work hard to keep it there. As the good news by the military's own admission, it's already more diverse than the rest of the population. So if that's an imperative, it sort of begs the question, what problem are we trying to solve? Second, the military has a proud history in terms of being one of the earliest institutions to force racial integration. Just look at the memoirs coming out of the Korean War. Look at Colder Than Hell by Lieutenant Joseph Owen. I mean, he talked about how the politicians had decimated the force, and though there was some reluctance, the overwhelming feeling was we needed every man we could get and that a marine was a marine i believe that ethos still pervades the military and i think that is the right ethos to guide our actions going forward what a great panel thank you everybody for being here thank you so much ladies and gentlemen that concludes panel five please make your way to the first floor of the air force one pavilion our luncheon discussion with secretary lloyd austin is about to begin
presentation of the colors by the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marines Color Guard. Please remain standing for the performance of our national anthem by LeVon Turner, U.S. Navy, Chief Aviation Boatswain's Mate of the USS Ronald Reagan. so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight we watch we're so gallantly streaming and the rock is regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the Please be seated. Please now join me in welcoming to the stage member of our Board of Trustees of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, Ms. Peggy Noonan. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Thank you to all of you for being with us last night and today, including early in the morning. Many of you traveled very far to be with us, and we appreciate it. It has been said, and it is true, that institutions are the lengthened shadows of individuals. This institution represents the thinking and philosophy that drove the career and achievements of Ronald Wilson Reagan, 40th President of the United States. It's no accident this institution, the Reagan Foundation and Library, is settled here in Simi Valley. If you get time, if there's any break today where you can walk around, you'll see there's a serenity in these rolling hills and a lot of scenic drama, too. Ronald Reagan's old friend John Ford, the first great genius of American cinema, shot 
films in these environs near here at Crash Corrigan's old ranch. It was Ford's work that gave many Americans, perhaps even most, a picture in their heads of what the American West looked like long after it had changed. It was later given the Medal of Freedom for that great gift to us. The beauty in Simi Valley is of a particularly expansive and rather American sort. You can look one way and you see the mountains. You look the other way and it's the sea. More than that, there's a sense of confidence, naturalness, and solidity in this place. And that is very much in line with the nature of the man it celebrates. People tend to remember Ronald Reagan as an optimist. That's what they call him, the great optimist. I'm not sure, having known him, that that is precisely true. He didn't always expect the right sweet thing to happen in any given circumstance. He was quite ironic about the chances the nice thing wouldn't happen. When I was thinking about this this morning, I remembered once after a long beleaguered day in the White House, in the middle of the Reagan years, Reagan was working on some tough bill and he had every member of the House, half the Senate into his office to speak with him. It was a long day. At the end of that day, someone brought his new puppy into the Oval Office to meet the President. One of his staffers did that. Reagan was endlessly patient with those things. So the staffer puts the puppy on the President's desk. Mike Deaver was there in the office and he said, get that thing off, he'll pee on the president's desk. <laughs> Reagan said, why not, everybody else does. <laughs> that may be, may be the first time such an anecdote has been on Fox News, so hello. Um, those are not <clears throat> precisely the words used, but you get the gist. Anyway, it wasn't optimism with Reagan, it was confidence. So getting to our purposes here, these hills are full of surprises, so is Ronald Reagan's history. He gave great and profound attention from the beginning of his public life to the national defense, and he certainly gave it in his presidency. He was associated to such a degree, he was associated in the public mind with military things. But of course, like any grown up, he didn't like war. He saw it for what it was, always disastrous, even when fully justified. And because of this, he believed the surest way to do the urgent daily thing of holding the peace, the surest way is to be strong and have the world know your strength. But he worried a lot. He worried more than he let on. He worried about the possible use of nuclear weapons. He once observed to me that a man, that man has never not used a weapon man had developed. And this concerned him too. And so connected to that, two of his great military related achievements rebuilding America's defense forces, bringing back the Army and Navy, which had been neglected and treated badly in the years after Vietnam, and also putting all he had into an ultimate goal of banning nuclear weapons or in the development of SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, which would make nuclear use less of a sure thing. If anything bad ever happened, you can do something against it. He felt weakness tempted adversaries and emboldened opportunists, so we must be strong. But dreadful weapons are called that because they're dreadful, and so we must be wise. We are meeting today uh, in an agitated world, 
we can all of us reel off the flashpoints. Everybody on the street in America can reel off the flashpoints. Ukraine and Russia, China, Taiwan, Iran, North Korea. It is now, I believe, common for people to feel that the world has not in their lifetimes been so dangerous. I interviewed Henry Kissinger a month ago in New York and asked him during the interview, I said, look, are people right that this is a uniquely dangerous moment in our history? And he thought for a second and his answer was a simple yes, they are how to handle this, respond to it constructively, ease tensions, cool what can be cooled, face what must be faced, is the work of leaders, officials, holders of high elected and appointed office. And we are very pleased to have a very important one as our first speaker today. In January 2021, Lloyd James Austin III was sworn in as America's 28th Secretary of Defense. He was born in Alabama, raised in Thomasville, Georgia. From there on to West Point with a Bachelor of Science degree. From there a commission in the Army Infantry. In a 41 year career, he has known command at the core division, battalion, and brigade levels. He was awarded the Silver Star for his leadership of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division during the invasion of Iraq in 20, 2003. He was commanding general of U.S. Forces Iraq where he oversaw all combat operations. I first met him there in Iraq in a dusty old briefing area more than a decade ago when he provided my delegation of so-called experts a candid, comprehensive, and friendly briefing. It was friendly in terms of trust and candor. He concluded his uniformed service as the commander of U.S. Central Command in the Middle East and Afghanistan. In that assignment, he led U.S. and coalition forces against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. <coughs> I beg your pardon. He has been called, I sort of Googled around to see what was said when he was appointed Secretary of Defense. He has been called a true and tested soldier and leader, a man of the highest integrity. He is, quote, steady in the, sta in the saddle and establishes a great command climate He's been called a no-drama defense secretary, quiet, low-key. We are honored and delighted that he has agreed again to come today, and we hope he will not be quiet and low-key and low-drama. And We trust he will give us a candid briefing on exactly how he is seeing the world. Please welcome Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Well, good morning, everyone, and Peggy, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. The Reagan Foundation and institution has been a great host, but you know, it feels a little unfair to be expected to give a speech after Peggy Noonan. And as you pointed out, Peggy, the last time that we saw each other was actually in Iraq in a dusty conference room in a palace in the palace at Baghdad. So this indeed is a bit nicer, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here with a, an outstanding delegation from the Department of Defense, including Secretaries Warmoth, 
Secretary Del Toro and Secretary Kendall. as well as members of the Joint Chiefs, combatant commanders, and more. So let's give the Joint Chiefs and the combatant commanders a round of applause. We also have a distinguished bipartisan delegation here from the United States Congress. And I always appreciate your constructive partnership, and I'm confident that we'll keep coming together to keep America secure, including the passing of a full-year omnibus appropriation. And I look forward to working with you in the coming weeks and in the 118th Congress. I'm honored to see ambassadors and defense ministers from allied and partner countries. So, welcome. Now, it's already been a very productive trip to California. And yesterday was a proud day for our country and the United States Air Force. I was in Palmdale to participate in the historic unveiling of the B-21 Raider. And that's the long-range strike stealth bomber that will soon be the backbone of the Air Force bomber fleet. The B-21 was developed over seven years by our partners at Northrop Grumman. So it was a really proud day for, for Kathy, and, and very well done, by the way. And it shows that we're clear-eyed about what it's going to take to keep America secure in the 21st century. You see, the B-21 is an extraordinary display of combat power and a major advance for American deterrence. And making this bomber required harnessing the driving forces of American innovation and ingenuity. And drawing on both, free minds and free enterprise. And ladies and gentlemen, only one country on earth consistently delivers that combination, and that's the United States of America. American power, innovation, and values make the U.S. military the strongest fighting force in human history. And make no mistake, we're going to keep it that way. And so our job is simple. We don't lose focus because of polls or politics. The U.S. military is here to fight and win our nation's war. And we will always work to deter conflict whenever we can. But if we are forced to defend ourselves, we will win. And we will win beyond doubt. Now, as President Biden has said, we stand in a decisive decade. And these next few years will set the terms of our com competition with the People's Republic of China. And they will shape the future of security in Europe, and they will determine whether our children and grandchildren inherit an open world of rules and rights, or whether they face emboldened autocrats who seek to dominate by force and fear. As some of you may know, I was at the Halifax International Security Forum in Canada two weeks ago. And I was introduced to a brave young Ukrainian soldier. And we spoke briefly about what she'd seen in her, her fight to defend her country. The next day I saw that young soldier again. And she was weeping because six of her brothers and sisters in arms had been killed overnight by Russian forces. And through her tears, she presented me with a Ukrainian flag signed by some of the fighters who liberated the city of Kyrgyzstan. And she told me that the next day she was headed back to Ukraine to rejoin the fight. And so ladies and gentlemen, that's what's at stake in this decisive decade. So let me reaffirm a basic American truth. In the struggle between those fighting to defend democracy and those bent on imperial aggression, the United States stands with the forces of freedom. And we are determined to use American power to defend our great democracy and to bend the arc of history toward liberty. 
and I am confident that America is up for the great competitions ahead. You know, President Reagan liked to tell the story of an elderly British woman whose home was bombed during the Blitz of London. And when the rescuers arrived, they found a bottle of brandy that she had stored behind her staircase, which was the only thing actually still left standing. And so she was barely conscious, and one of the rescuers pulled the cork out of the bottle to give her a taste of the brandy. And she came around and immediately said, hey, put that back. That's for emergencies. <laughs> now that's the spirit that we need. This is no time to hold back our resources or our resolve. To meet this moment, we're going to need help from Congress, industry, and more. And I hope that you will join us in this mighty task. To shape this decisive decade, we're driving hard to further strengthen America's deterrence. And we're taking on the generational pacing challenge posed by the People's Republic of China. And we're tackling the acute threat of Putin's Russia and defending the rules-based international order that keeps us all secure. And we're going to do all of this the American way, by drawing on the full force of American innovation and American industry to ensure that we get our war fighters what they need before they need it. And at this hinge in history, we're carrying forth the great American tradition of strong, principled, global leadership alongside our stalwart allies and our valued partners in the service of human freedom. So let's start with American deterrence. It lies at the core of the national defense strategy that guides the department. We've got the right strategy and the right operational concepts. And they're driving us to make the right investments for our warfighters. So we're upgrading and honing and strengthening our armed forces for a changing world, even as we shore up the, found, the strong foundation that has kept us secure for decades. Because in our imperfect world, deterrence does come through strength. And we will continue to make clear to any potential foe the folly of aggression against the United States at any time or any place, in any theater or any domain. So in our deterrence means air power. So in our fiscal year 2023, Deterrence means air power. So in our fiscal year 2023 budget, the department has requested more than $56 billion for air power, focused on the F-35 and the F-15 EX fighters, the B-21 bomber, mobility aircraft, and manned systems. And American air power helps deter conflict every day from joint exercises with our Indo-Pacific partners to aerial drills with our allies to protect NATO's eastern flank. Deterrence means sea power. So we're investing in the new construction of nine battle force ships in our Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines. And just last month, one of our Ford-class nuclear-powered carriers made its first transit to Europe. Deterrence means long-range fire like the HIMARS systems that have been so crucial to Ukraine's self-defense. Long-range fires will be vital for contingencies in the Indo-Pacific as well. So we're investing in land-based hypersonic missile batteries in an air-launched hypersonic cruise missile. And the USS Zumwalt will become the first Navy platform to field hypersonics. Deterrence means cutting-edge capabilities in domains where 21st century conflicts could erupt, including space and cyberspace. And finally, 
Deterrence means a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal as the ultimate backstop to deter strategic attacks on our country and our allies, including NATO, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. And so that's why our fiscal year 2023 budget includes $34 billion to continue modernizing our nuclear triad. And to bolster our nuclear command and control and communications. You know, when you add that up, that's a lot. But we've got more to do. So let me urge Congress to pass an on-time appropriation so that we can get the capabilities to further strengthen our deterrence. Now to complete, to compete in this decisive decade, we've sharpened the department's focus on our primary theater of operations which is the Indo-Pacific. And we're working to be able to mobilize and deploy American troops more quickly and investing in military construction and logistics and infrastructure across the region. We've requested billions to modernize the Marines into a highly mobile expeditionary force and to maneuver better in the critical first island chain, we're investing in nimble new groupings like the Army's multi-domain task forces. And as we strengthen our deterrence, we're fortified by the allies and partners who share our, our values. Here's one simple military truth. Our allies and partners are a phenomenal force multiplier. And as Margaret Margaret Thatcher once said, we will not stay free for long if we have no allies or no friends or no alliances. Our network of alliances and partnerships is a core of strategic strength. And no other country on earth has anything like it. So just a few weeks ago, the American Carrier Strike Group, named for President Reagan, conducted operations alongside the Canadian and Japanese navies in the Philippine Sea. And days later, the strike group came together, again with the Japanese, with Japanese and Australian and Indian forces for the annual Malabar exercise. As one of the American commanders described our operations, we have Australian, an Australian supply ship bringing millions of gallons of fuel and food and supplies to a carrier strike group escorted by Japanese, Canadian, and American warships. Now that type of cooperation is rare and precious in world history. But for the United States and our allies and partners, it's all in a day's work. Or consider the AUKUS partnership. Next week, I'll welcome my Australian and UK counterparts to Washington for an important AUKUS defense ministerial. And so we're working together on advanced capabilities such as AI and hypersonics, and we're charting the best pathway for Australia to acquire a nuclear-powered, conventionally armed submarine as early as possible, all while upholding the highest nonproliferation standards. Now, our network of allies and partners just didn't happen. It is a direct result of decades of American leadership. And our friends know that we'll stand with them to support freedom of navigation and to defend the rights of small countries to not be bullied by larger ones and to defend stability and sovereignty and the potential for prosperity that they bring. Now, the National Defense Strategy is clear-eyed about our main competitors, and that starts with the People's Republic of China. In recent decades, its military has embarked on a breakneck program of modernization. And the PRC is the only country with both the will and increasingly the power to reshape its region and the international order to suit its author authoritarian preferences. So let me be clear. We will not let that happen. And that begins with America's combat credible deterrence. And we're going to sustain and sharpen our warfighting advantages so that the PRC can never conclude 
that aggression is in its best interest. We're aligning our budget, as never before, to the China challenge. And we're making the department's largest investment ever in R&D and forging stronger capabilities. And we're modernizing training and equipping the, the U.S. military contingencies in the Indo-Pacific. DOD is finally making fundamental and unprecedented shifts in attention and resources towards Asia. And ladies and gentlemen, the department is putting its focus, its time, and its money where its mouth is. And so we're matching our investments with new operational concepts suited to 21st century deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. And we're bolstering our forward presence in the region to build a more lethal, mobile, and distributed force posture. And we'll keep investing in a strategy of deterrence and denial. Now, we're not doing this alone. I just returned last week from Southeast Asia, where I met in, Cam in Cambodia with defense leaders from around the region. And nearly every one of them shares our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, a region in which countries, large and small, can chart their own futures and have the capabilities to defend their own interests. We're also deeply committed to responsibly managing our competition with the PRC, even as we defend our interests, our allies, and our partners. And while I was in Cambodia, I met with General Wei, the PRC's Minister of National Defense. And I made clear that great powers need to compete responsibly and keep lines of communication open and build guardrails at multiple levels. And I also underscored our serious concerns about the increasingly dangerous behavior that we're seeing from PLA aircraft flying in the Indo-Pacific. And I made clear that the United States will continue to fly, to sail, and operate wherever international law allows. You know, great powers must choose responsibility over recklessness. Great powers must communicate with candor and respect the hard-won hard system of international laws and alliances and norms and agreements that has made us all more secure and prosperous since the end of World War II. You know, we can't take that open and stable order for granted. And that's one key reason that the world has come together to condemn and resist Russia's reckless war of choice in Ukraine. And this decade will be decisive for security in Europe as well as in Asia. But let's be clear about what we've seen in Ukraine. Russia wasn't provoked. Russia wasn't threatened. Russia wasn't attacked. Instead, one man chose war. And Putin's war is not the result of NATO expansion. It is the cause of NATO expansion. And now, because of the Kremlin's longing for a vanished empire, Europe faces its worst security crisis since the, since the end of World War II. And a member of the UN Security Council. Let me say that again. A member of the UN Security Council is waging war to deny democracy to more than 43 million people. With deliberate cruelty, Russia is putting civilians and civilian infrastructure in its gun sites. Russian forces have killed thousands of Ukrainian citizens, even as millions more have fled. And Russian attacks have left children dead, schools shattered, and hospitals smashed. So Russia's neighbors view its imperial aggression with growing alarm. And Putin's war of choice has given everyone on Earth a preview of a world of tyranny and turmoil that nobody would want to live in. And Russia's 
assault on its peaceful neighbor has shown every country on earth the dangers of disorder. And so that's why so many countries of goodwill have raced to get Ukraine the capabilities to defend itself, including some 50 members of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group that we created and led. That's why our united and resolute NATO allies have bolstered the, the alliance's forward defenses and reinforced its eastern flank. And it's why the United States has raised our total number of service members deployed in Europe from 80,000 to more than 100,000, and permanently, st permanently forward stationed forces in Poland, and hammered home our ironclad commitment to NATO and to Article 5. So let's be clear. We will not be dragged in Putin's war, but we will stand with Ukraine as it fights to defend its citizens and its sovereignty. And we will stand strong with our NATO allies, and we will defend every inch of NATO territory. Now that young Ukrainian fighter and her comrades in arms have shown the moral and military power of a free people roused to its defense. And her fellow citizens on the home front have shown immense resilience in the teeth of Russian aggression. From President Biden on down, U.S. leadership has been vital to Ukraine's success. And we're going to support Ukraine's right to defend itself for as long as it takes. Now, our ability to shape this decisive decade rests on America's enduring advantages in national security. So we work hard to draw on the full range of talents of the American people. And we're driven by the power of patriotism and our restless spirit of innovation. Our free enterprise system is key to our national defense. Our defense industrial base is unmatched, and we've got to keep it that way. You know, our outstanding Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, and I meet regularly with industry leaders, including some new partners that used to think the Pentagon was just too hard to work with. And fr from the World War II mobilization to the MRAPs that I saw in Iraq, our public-private defense partnership protects American troops in the field. So we're working to, to strengthen that industrial base for the long haul. We're also working closely with Congress to secure multi-year procurement authorities and allow us to meet the needs of tomorrow. Now, our partners in the private sector have flagged a consistent problem. Even when they can see a way to deliver a promising technology to a military customer, Securing the necessary, necessary capital to, to bring that capability to scale is hard. and sometimes impossible. So we've listened and we've acted. Our Defense Innovation Unit is focused on identifying priority technology areas and using faster methods to get that tech into the hands of warfighters. And earlier this week, I announced the creation of the department's Office of Strategic Capital. This important office will work to secure U.S. private sector investment in critical defense technology areas, ensuring that technology developed in, the, in America benefits America. And it's exam an example of how we're creating the conditions for innovation, uh, innovators, innovators to succeed. You know. This kind of change doesn't always move as smoothly or as quickly as I'd like. But we are determined to change the way that the Pentagon does business and to create a, a true innovation uh, ecosystem. Let me make one last point. American firepower is extraordinary. But over the course of my brief 41 year career in uniform, I learned that the source of our strength isn't just our weapons. 
It's our democracy. And that democracy demands something of us all. It's a daily referendum that asks us all what we are willing to give to the cause of American ideals and human freedom. It's time to ask ourselves what each of us will do to help shape this rare and malleable moment in the course of human events. Now, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines and guardians risk their lives every day for all of our security. And even in times of challenge or in hours of division, the American men and women who wear the cloth of our nation inspire us all with their unity of purpose. And they challenge us to put our shoulder to the wheel to seize this moment to make America more secure and the world more just. To rally together with our allies and partners who magnify our strength. And to prove again that the, that the democratic ideals of America's founding still provide the world with a powerful beacon of hope. So let me quote President Reagan one last time, and this time about what history remembers. Yes, the deeds of infamy and injustice are all recorded, he said. But what shines out from the pages of history is the daring of the dreamers and the deeds of the builders and the doers. So, in this decisive decade, let us pledge again to be the dreamers, the builders, and the doers. And let us forge a world of greater security, prosperity, and liberty. And let us meet America's challenges with confidence and courage in a can-do spirit. And let us come together to build a brighter, safer future for this country that we love and the democracy that we defend. Thank you very much, and may God continue to bless the United States of America.